to the Starting Line podcast with me, Rich Lee. I'm talking today to a comedian, a performer, a poet, and one half of the BBC's Infinite Monkey Cage, alongside Professor Brian Cox. That's right. Today, I'm talking to Robert Ince. Robert and Brian were in Cheltenham to talk at the Cheltenham Science Festival with Steve Backshall and others, and... It was great for Robin to be able to make time for me. We had a wonderful chat. This chat that you're going to listen to went everywhere. Um, Robin's got an incredible brain, you'll see. Um, and then I was his lift to Cheltenham, and we had a fantastic chat in the car as well. About that kind of became a bit more about the podcast and branding, and you know where we're going with it, which is um, which is just. I feel lucky to have had that conversation because I think Robin saw something in me and in this podcast and what we're doing and, you know, possibly in the listeners, the viewers, that that might have sparked a little fire. So, whereas I said that this Series 2 might go on infinitely, I'm not so sure it will now. I think, you know, we've got more recorded and we're going to bring, bring you more, but I feel like it could pause for a bit while I tinker and come back. Don't worry, all the episodes will still be the same. Everything, yeah, there'll, there'll be slight changes. But all that is in the future. Let's not worry about that right now. Instead, enjoy this wonderful chat. Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it, including a beautiful moment where Robin, I think towards the end, recites one of his poems from, um, you know, from memory and brought a tear to my eye. Um, so enjoy, subscribe, review, all that good stuff. Without further ado, I bring to you my conversation with Robin Ince. Enjoy. So what have you been doing this morning? Uh, I was doing a school school talk, which is always fascinating. So I got I got back from, uh, I was doing the Royal Institution. That's my life. Uh, Royal Institution with Judy Dench. Just yeah. normal. Just, just normal, normal. Just the casual. Yeah. Who was as brilliant as you'd imagine Judy Dench. Is that Dench the first time you met her? Yeah. And, and well, I met her very briefly when uh, I was I was hosting the Film Critics Circle Award uh, because the two people who were going to do it suddenly fell out and people wow. would just go, are you available? Because I'm quite good <laughs> at dealing with chaos. Right, okay. And, uh, and I had a lovely time there. But she was just, Judy Dench is so full of love and delight and uh, and she was talking about all the trees she's got, which is, she's got six acres of, of, of woodland and the trees are planted in memory of lots of people because when 1962, she saw a tree in memory of Vivian Lee, which is, of course, a great opening for when I write the poem about that. And um, and so she plants them, you know, for her late husband, Michael Williams, for all these things. And it is, I'm lucky. I think most of the people that I've met who I've admired have not been a letdown. I think I'm reasonably good at seeing through who's actually a charlatan. And and she was, I told her a couple of quite rude jokes. <laughs> Go on, she, can you repeat well, well, one of, Yeah, I can. It's one of my favourite jokes because Barry Cryer used to ring up uh, Judy Dench every uh, every week to tell her a joke. So I went through and I, I told her the last joke that uh, Barry Cryer is meant to have ever said when he was in hospital bed, which is uh, a couple are walking down the street and they look across the road and they go, oh my goodness, I think that's the Archbishop of Canterbury. I think it is. She says to her husband, go over and ask him. So he walks over, says, excuse me, I'm sorry to bother you, but are you the Archbishop of Canterbury? And he says, fuck off. <laughs> and uh, then he walks back and he goes, what did he say? And he just said, fuck off. And he goes, oh, I suppose we'll never know then. So there you go. That's the, uh, <laughs> that, that was Barry Cry's point. So we were just doing that. And obviously the jokes that end, uh, that's a surprise. He's only done it twice. The first time he was sick and the second time it's happily won. I'm a big fan of punchlines without any setup. Like the, right. I don't know, but the Pope's his chauffeur. You know, I love those kind of things. <laughs> How did you get into comedy? The thing oh. with you, Robin, before I get into that actually is, and as I said, you know, I sadly had to miss the party political broadcast last night because you know, I was spending time watching you instead. Um, you've done so many things. You know, from from the poetry to the books to the comedy to um, you know the, the the show, um, you know, Infinite Monkey Cage. You've done so many things; it's hard to know where to start. But I guess comedy is as good a place as any. Well, yeah, that is your the first starting 1990, point. Is that yeah, right? ninety one? I think nineteen ninety or ninety one. But yeah, it probably was nineteen ninety. So I was twenty years old when I did my first gig, and I just loved it. It was one of those things that you know, as an outsider kid, comedy was almost my punk. It was because before that, there was the goodies and there were those kind of things. And then you know, nineteen seventy nine, nineteen eighty is a ten year old start hearing about Alexi Sale and Rick Mail, see Rick Mail on television for the first time. And I was utterly obsessed. And it was, you know, if, if I, I when my dad finally bought a Betamax video recorder, uh, it, it was like every single thing with anything involved Rick Mail or any of that comedy gang. Um, and I could, I remembered, you know, I can see, in fact, I'm doing a tour with the comic strip presents at the moment. And 
I can I remember almost every single line. It was I watched them. It would be triple figures. Are, are we talking know, like, like the young ones? The, the, the young ones, and then uh, the comic strip presents Five Gum Out in Dorset and Bad News and everything since then, and and it was my escape. I mean, I loved music as well. But comedy was the place where, again, I think I think outsider kids that you need some shared common language with the other outsider kids. So before that, it would probably be Doctor Who, which of course still works as an outsider. But, you know, I mean, I love the fact that when Russell T Davis, the first three episodes which he returned on last year with David Tennant, that he just stuck his finger up to all of the regressive people. He just went. She's trans, that policeman's got a turban on, and the person who's going to say who's going to save them is in a wheelchair. There we go. Sorry, everyone. Here's my Johnny Cash finger. You know, and it was, and I still think that's there. And so Doctor Who was, uh, there's that lovely story of Tom Baker when walking down Oxford Street once, and a, and a, a middle aged man stopped him. So I'm so sorry to stop you, Mr. Baker, but I was in a care home when I was growing up, and it was really tough. But every Saturday we had you. And that's when you realize it's a constant, how it, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's Creativity just... and art is that's why I hate it when it just becomes, shouldn't really use the word hate, but that bit where you just know it's product and that bit where there's certain comics where I just think this is inauthentic right. and then you watch someone and you go, they mean it and it means something to them. So yeah, that was. And then when so I was, was Alexei Alexi Sale, Rick Mail, anybody Alexi, else jump on? And then, you know, and then obviously also people like Victoria Wood yeah. and French and Saunders and uh, the whole, the whole kit and kaboom. Yeah. So like, did you immediately, immediately think comedy is where I need to be? Well, I don't know. I mean, I thought I would probably be too shy and too nervous about it. Is that what kind um, of kid you were? Were you quite a reclusive um, kid? Like I you... was kind of a mix. I was quite, I, I wasn't, you know, I was certainly, you know, I was very much the, you know, as I always say to, to, to quite often, well, not always, but sometimes to the audience, I say, you know, the, one of the cool things about my audience is very few of them were ever picked first for games, you know, and it's kind of, and I, yeah, I didn't enjoy you know, most of the period of growing up, I did feel quite kind of, uh, I had all the, you know, these things buzzing in my head and so many ideas, but and but I was quite, and but I could sometimes be, I was never the class clown in that way, but I w was still quite funny in my own way. And people who got it would like, but again, the niche kids were like, you know, in fact, I meet people now who knew me when I was 10 and go, God, you've not changed. Oh, I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's kind of a badge of honour, isn't it, really? Like, you know, to, to still have something of yourself that people can recognise. Well, I think it's an interesting thing because I went to quite a posh school and uh, which I hated. Just like, Where'd you go? Here, Cheltenham, Cheltenham College. Ch oh, of yeah. course you did. And, and I, uh, it was, you know, it was nightmarish because, you know, you, you can't, there's no escape. Yeah. And, uh, and it was a board? great lesson. Yeah, it was a brilliant lesson because I remember the first kind of assembly and the head teacher goes, you've got to remember you're in the top 10% of the country. And even at 13, I was like, no, this is a wow. financial institution. This mm. is not a... And so that cynicism or scepticism towards it. And then I was chatting with a friend of mine who... I've just been working on a book about kind of neurodivergence and lots of other things. And I was thinking about how important trauma is in, in who we become sometimes. And I was asking some of my, well, I've got one very, very close friend who I still have from school who was similarly on the outside. And I had never known things like, he said, I went to that school as a happy-go-lucky 13-year-old and I came out just having been destroyed. It's not character building, it's character destroying. A lot of our institutions are not about School can be. Yeah, they're about moulding you into... And he told me about when he was dragged down a corridor at the age of 13, naked, and they poured hot wax on his genitals, you know, and things like that. And then I talked to When you say they, that's... Uh, just another bunch of kids, yeah. And it was... Um, and I was talking to my friend Charlie, who's been a secondary school teacher, uh, and and he's a great, he's a he's a real he's basically he's dead poet society. And uh, you know I've 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 done events with him, and I just see the way the kids react to him. And he said that bit of remaining who you are. He said both of us when we went to school and we didn't like it and we didn't fit in, but we stayed. We stayed our ground. It didn't matter how many times we got beaten up or whatever. We still. And he said if you have a little bit of trauma in your, it's like. You've already had a thing that set you up. Even though you think it would be easier to fit in, you can't. It's too late. And if you're lucky, and a lot of people aren't lucky, I'm lucky because I come from a lot of privilege. And I think of the number of people who, for instance, are in prison, etc., who are neurodivergent because they didn't have that extra thing. Mm -hmm. Something Lawrence Fox should wake up to and various others. Just acknowledge your just privilege. Just a bit of kindness. You know, yeah. that's all it takes is just to understand it. Because, I mean, for me, I'm, I was the opposite. I was a sporty kid. You know, I yeah. was, and, and the second that you kind of, you know, find yourself in that position, school's a doddle. School yeah. was easy for me. And because if you're good at sport, 
teachers let you know tend to let you get away with a little bit of you know ah that's all right he's, you know uh you know where well, we want him playing <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. you know it happens and then right rightly or wrongly kids gravitate towards the the, the ones that are I guess a bit I was always a bit bigger I was always yeah, yeah, yeah. you know so you, they gravitate but the thing that you're just saying there I'd had all that but at home and I didn't tell anybody anything yeah. I didn't talk about you know my home life at all in fact until you saying ah oh, you're exactly the same kid as you were my friends now now I'm a tiny bit more open about things they're like we had no idea it's like no you wouldn't because I, I wouldn't have let you because I would have felt like it was a weakness which is a weird oh you see that though oh, is that was... true as well yeah gosh. what no one knew including my wife uh Never knew about the fact that I had perpetual anxiety. Right. So from the moment I woke up to the moment if I did go to sleep, and so, so that's so so. But that's an intro. Oh God, sorry, I've had a donut. Uh, <laughs> Me too. I'm on, on a real sugar high now. But it is I because on the other side of things, what I did conceal was uh, anxiety and a constant critical voice, a constant mm. heckling voice, which I only got over two in two and a half years ago, and. Uh, and that is the interesting thing because I found with a lot of my closest friends, we look at each other now, many of us have, have changed hugely in our understanding of ourselves, but not changed on, on the outside. Mm. My, my friend Joe, who's wonderful, who's, I should have, you know, the bits where you think I should have known that, that that is a big clue of neurodivergence. One, the number of audience members who would come up to me after a gig and say, we've made a note of the 27 stories you began and did not finish. Like the school <laughs> talk I was doing this morning, yeah. I said, I'm going to start off by talking about gorillas. It was 40 minutes in before I got to telling the gorilla <laughs> story. But Joe, Joe, I went up to, I'd seen her tap dancing at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. I thought, oh, that's great tap dancing. Never met before. I said, oh, hello, I really enjoyed your tap dancing. I'm currently reading out from a bunch of giant killer crab novels in the show that I'm doing. And I really thought your tap dancing could enhance some of the giant killer crab attacks. And do you fancy doing the show? And she said, yes. So both of us there should have known. One, anyone who opens with a stranger by saying, I'm doing a load of shows about giant killer crab and novels from the 1970s. Sure. And I'd like you to tap dance to it. And anyone who then says yes immediately, <laughs> you're, you know, there we are. You're in. You're yeah. in. There are more than one giant killer crab book from the 70s. Yeah, yeah. Crabs on the Rampage, obviously <laughs> Crab's Moon, Night of the Crabs, Origin of the Crabs. I could go on, but I won't for your own sanity. Much appreciated. That would be, I'm always curious. I think that's what, um, one thing I wanted to start with as well is in some of the things I was watching, one of the YouTube comments, I always say don't read them. Right? Because they're, it's, it's weird. YouTube comments get weird. But one of them said... Robin Ince is wonderful because he always believes, or because he believes he's always the dumbest person in the room. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think it's really important to be like, because so often, you know, I'm surrounded by people whose, whose depth of knowledge, yeah. and, and I'm no longer fearful of showing my ignorance. Isn't I it think wonderful? That's what yeah. I was about to say is you're not the dumbest person in this room, I promise you. Um, but it's not, about being, it's not about being dumb. For me, it's curiosity. And that's the whole reason I do this is because, and that's what I, I guess, you know, if I may say that, you know, chimed with me in terms of you is you just seem endlessly curious and yeah. also a very, very aware to say, as I am, and I've, I've said on this tons of times, I don't know anything about that. Tell me, you yeah. know, I, I, I'm happy to be, I'm happy to be the idiot because that way I learn, you know, what am I going to pretend that I know more than I do? What, why What's it, you know, I don't benefit from that. There's the whole, uh, you know, kind of learn as if you're going to live forever. Yeah. Notion. And I love that idea. So you are, you know, you're undoubtedly, you know, with, with Brian Cox, for instance, you know, with somebody with an incredible mind, just like, if I, I just listen, you know, like yeah. if I, I just like, keep, keep talking, come on, keep throwing it at me. Yeah. You need to prod them. That's yeah, the thing as well. You need to get that because to me, one of the great things that I've learned from Infinite Monk Cage and various other things is the the interesting thing is not the answers. The interesting thing is the new questions that grow mm. from it. So, yeah. you know, when we have the Large Hadron Collider and we just, you know, the Higgs field is, is, is proved to be a very, very strong idea of us understanding the nature of the universe and matter in the universe. That doesn't, that's not the end. That's the beginning of a new bit. And I think it's a bit like my, my dad died last year and I, I put up a picture of the last book that he was reading that he was halfway through that I'd actually found from a, for him a few days before. And someone said, oh, I always find it so sad seeing things like that. They didn't finish the book. And I said, I don't find that sad at all. I would find it sad if I showed a picture of the last book he read and then he lived another six months. The fact that my dad was, you know, to die halfway through a book is a good place because it you know there's you're never going to finish reading all the books you're never going to finish creating all the questions or finding all the answers and to know that you're still involved yeah that's what i love seeing I, I was chatting earlier with someone at the school saying that you know the one thing that i find with most of the audiences that i play to is that they all kind of vibrate at the same level of curiosity so 
you know, I was doing a, a couple of months ago. I was doing the Crick Institute in London, and in the front row was a Nobel Prize winner, a uh, wonderful man called Paul Nurse, br- brilliant person, great fun as well. And um, the next morning, I was doing a primary school, and in the front row was Willy Wonka and two Pokemon because it was National Book Day. And I don't think there was any great difference between the way I talked to either audience because I might have changed some of the words, I might have changed the other thing, but. Once people say, it's a bit like why I love playing places like Belfast and Liverpool and Glasgow is they'll see through you very fast. Those big former industrial cities, you know, those kind of, and that's the bit is if you're not putting on a front. Yeah. That's then. Yeah. And so a five-year-old and a six-year-old, I always think that's why I get on well with dogs and children. You know, it's it's like because I don't, I hope I don't patronise them. I just think, you know, we'll we'll find a stumbling block and you might say, I don't understand what you're talking about, old man, or whatever. But as long as you just use, I always think, you know, patronise that. Oh, you're a little child. And I never have that. You know, my son's 16 now. And, you know, we went to a Johnny Marr gig the other day and had such a great time. And and it was, and I think, you know, something that comes out of, of, and I see this with a few of my friends is you don't, you can be in charge of your children and aware of the dangers and all that stuff, but you don't have to patronise them. You don't have to turn them. And I think it changes our relationship with, you know, because for me, there's a lot of things I'd love to have asked my mum and my dad, but it's kind of like, there are your parents, Mm -hmm. there are you. Especially, I mean, you were born 69, right? Yeah. So, you know, growing up in the 70s, presumably, there's a different way of parenting then to to what there is now. I mean, what did your parents do? Well, my my, my mum was, one of the things that happened with my mum, she she started a career, she worked as a secretary in a a creative agency. And she used to love talking about the time that Cary Grant would come in and go, morning, ladies. And and, and, (laughs) oh, it's Cary Grant. And and my dad- I probably didn't have done the same thing. Yeah, no, I I think there's no, um, and and she was very much of that. I find the scrapbook she had as a teenager and they're filled with either Audrey Hepburn or Air Stewards because that's what everyone wanted to do in the 50s. And my dad ended up, he, he started off, he did for a, he did national service, then did a couple of years uh, working in the theatre and then ended up working in a publishing company that just published uh, the ABC Rail Guide. So if anyone's ever seen uh, or read the ABC Murders by Agatha Christie, it's kind of based on those things. No, I mean, I have a fantastic book. Yeah, it's yeah. great. And it's, I, mean, um, I think Agatha Christie, I mean, she's, she sold more books, it's second only to the Bible. Right, yeah. I think, and in, in, in terms of it, and I started reading her when I was a teenager, and I think some of my friends are like, "Oh, it's really, you know, that's not cool." She's phenomenal. Yeah, Agatha Christie and like, twisted. When, when I people first, think it's quaint, gone. it's not cream tea uh, and The murder of Roger Ackroyd was yeah. the first I read, and I could not believe it. I, I like to that point, and it's a beautiful thing with books where you know you then want to share, you know, like read it, read it, because I need you to feel what I felt. And in fact, before we carry on, I know. You're a fan of secondhand books and, yeah. and, and you're finding things. Um, I've bought you a book that I most recently read. Cool. Um, and it's I love for you. That. Um, and it's uh, Before the Coffee Gets Cold, Oh, which is quite apt considering your coffee. But that's very cold. good because I always have cold coffee because like, they made me a coffee at the school. And of course, once I started talking, well, it's, yeah, I, it, I it never put there. the cup to me. Um, yeah. Have you read it? Have you heard no, of it? No, I haven't. Let okay. me have a look. There you go. So it is a beautiful, beautiful story um, translated from Japanese. Um, and it is about a cafe in Japan where. You have the time it takes your coffee to get cold, where you can travel, where you can time travel. Effectively, you can't you can't impact the future or the past, but um, you know it's a, it's a wonderful kind oh, of like look that. at humanity. Yeah. Like, you know, look at what would you do if you had your time with somebody again? Well, I think that is yeah, that's exactly. Um, I mean, the big you, you uh, I suppose instant of my childhood was that I was, uh, and this is, I'll, I'll, I'll say, cause it's one of those things, when my dad died last year and I was doing the eulogy and stuff, and it was, it's the bit where you suddenly focus on, so, like one of the things I would say that was unusual about the parenting that uh, is uh, my dad, for instance, when he was offered promotion, didn't take promotion because he knew it would cut down the amount of time he had with us, and he knew he was away quite a lot anyway. My mum was in a serious car accident that I was in too, and uh, she was... In particular, she she the, the brain injuries and stuff like that. And when she first came out, she was basically mad when she came out of the hospital. She'd been in a coma. And my dad was eventually told, the doctor said, if I was you, Nigel, I would just put her in a home and get on with your life. And no, that's not, you know, and he never thought that. 
And it was very interesting because I was watching the great, I don't know if you know the musician Robert Wyatt, who was a soft machine, and he and then he 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 fell out of a window and broke his spine and right. and uh and beautiful, beautiful artist. And um he uh he was being interviewed years ago, long before the Jimmy Savile thing came out, and he was being interviewed about being in Stoke Mandeville Hospital. And Mark Ellen, the interviewer, said, Oh, you know, what was it like when Jimmy Savile came around? He went, Oh, well, I would always just pretend to be asleep. He said, But the women loved it. Mm. He said, because when a man has a spinal injury, more often than not, the woman will stay with him. When a woman has a spinal injury, the husband leaves normally after a month right. or two. So even that, which is very spooky, That's very unpleasant. But, and I remember him saying that, and I thought my dad would never have, and, and those things, I mean, that's one of the things in terms of, you know, talking about the starting line of, I, I look back now and I think of my sisters as well, I'm very close to my sisters, and, you know, so many of the things that we believe in, in fairness and justice, come from my dad my my dad would do things like the company he worked for he found out that the, they brought in a bonus system that didn't include the cleaners and he went in and he said why aren't the cleaners included in in the and they went well they're just cleaners aren't they he said yeah but imagine coming into your office and it's all messy and you've got to empty your bin and there's everything stuff all over the place and you're looking at how dust the car where did that come from like was what was he so, really believed in when he was it's like an atticus finch kind of well it was like fairness to it there's a lovely story which i he never told me but he told um my niece one of his grandchildren and and uh he uh he said when he was a little boy he was walking through the woods with his dad and they came across a poacher and his dad said evening sir and the poacher went, even sure. And uh, afterwards, my dad's little boy said, why did you call that man sir? Because he's a poacher. And he said, he's still a man. And that, and I, and, and that sounds, it almost sounds like kind of self-help, but, but it was really, you know, when I look back now in the village that I was brought up in. Where was that, by the way? It, it's just out, it, it's Metroland, John Betjeman's Metroland, just outside Chorleywood. It's a regular haunt of Midsummer Murders filming, right? right? There's, there's, and he, uh, yeah, I, I remember that he spoke and was friends. It didn't matter what class you were. It didn't matter your background. He wasn't someone who hung around like kind of people. It was like, you know, the road sweeper, Walter. Uh, the Because the, at that point in the village, the, most of the people who lived in the village still worked on the farms or, you know, river keepers and Mr. Hutch, the river keeper. And that was the thing. There was no, uh, which is a very odd thing. My, my dad really believed in, in treating everyone on an equal level. And I believe in that thing. It's like, you know, when people say you've got to earn respect, I think that's nonsense. I think what you, you, you lose respect. So you should start off every relationship and every conversation with respect for someone. And then you might go to hell with them. This is not a, a decent person or that I'm not going to. So, yeah, so that, that was very, very important to me. And I, and I look back now and I think of, you know, the, the, and I wish, as you said, you know, I would love to have talked, because my mum suffered after, after the accident, she suffered from depression for the rest of her life. And I would love to have talked to her more about that. She's a very good mum, I should add, as well. You know, in those... I, know, I guess the book speaks yeah, to that. Yeah, but that's that. perfect. The, the, the book you know, speaks because... to that. It really does. I mean, in fact, there's, there's, there's an aspect of it that sounds very weirdly parallel to, uh, you know, to, to, to that exact thing of not being able to speak to somebody when you wish that you could have done. Yeah. Um, what would you have asked her? I would just like to have known more of her because I know that one of the things was that when she did wake up out of the coma and and with the she didn't recognise all of us and stuff like that when she came back. And, and you I were know two or three. I, I was yeah. It was it was two days before my third birthday. Amazingly, I still had a birthday party. We didn't know what was going on. Yeah, you know, and my dad kept it quiet. She was in a coma, and then when she came out, I, I think the effect on my sisters may well have been greater than on me because they were older, and so when this very frail woman came in with a metal frame around her head and all that, I think they were probably in, they're probably quite scared. You know, what's happened to our mum? And I, uh, but yeah, so, so uh, sorry, the question, uh, oh no, I, I just, yeah, I, I, I think, and the, in the last few years of my dad's life, I think he was, it wasn't that anything was hidden. We weren't like that, but it was just, we just moved on with it. You know, it, it, it's a bit like someone talk about this on stage. My dad never said he loved me, but it was never important because I knew that he did. And, and we got on very well. It was not a hidden thing. We had lots of shared interests. And he was, I remember when my brother-in-law died and, and my sister was really worried. She went, I've, no, I've never heard dad so upset before because he would have been, he would have felt it was very unfair because the natural order of things is that he would die before his daughter's husband died, right? And they said, maybe go, go, go take dad for a walk and try and have a chat. And of course I, I tried that almost put my arm around him and it was just he didn't have quite have that way of being able to to talk 
but he did have that way of being able to express himself through action. And so I never feel, I know other people have, you know, you, I think it was Paul Merton talked about, you know, he, I think he always thought that his dad probably thought what a silly job Paul has. And, uh, and then when he died, he, Paul found that there was a, a scrapbook which had everything about what he'd done. And that's the bit, those are the secrets that we need to avoid. You know, it's to me, it's, it's tragic. And I'm, I'm so happy that I don't have that. But it's tragic to me that so many parents don't seem to be able to just say, I love you, or just show. You know, it's, it's that bit we were talking about before we started recording. You know, that biblical father that is embodied by God is this person who's perpetually annoyed with his children. And I think people feel that, you know, that there's, and also I think now people are almost scared of children. And I always used to find that when I went to parties, because I, I, you know, when you've got a kid, of course, the first thing that happens is you have to go to parties where you meet parents that you never met before. And I'm not, you know, that kind of, I don't watch Top Gear. I'm not, I, I, and that bit where you then all the men stand You don't have all the, the women. Chat and yeah, all I that. don't like that bit. That why, why are all the men in one corner and all the women in another? We've got lots of common ground. Let's find that. And so I'd often just go and do the washing up or play with the kids. And I could see that some men now are almost like, oh. I think it's changing. I really yeah, do. I think it is, you know. but I think they get worried. I think then there was a point where it had changed. And then people went, oh my God, what if people think, well, I remember hearing on a radio phone in once, someone going, yeah, I mean, why would a man want to be a primary school teacher? You've got to worry about things like that. And you go, what? Crazy, crazy. Yeah. I mean, the other, it's a funny thing. The other day, my daughter, so I've got four children, um, almost 18, 13. You're only about 20, aren't you? <laughs> Everyone looks so young when you're I'm 55. I'm 36, I'm 36. <laughs> um, so yeah, 18. So I had my first daughter when I was 18. Um, she's 18 September, 13, 6, and newborn. Um, because apparently every six years I do this to myself. <laughs> <laughs> but um, my, my now not youngest daughter, but my six-year-old, I, I was in the playground the other day and one of her friends, who we've had over and, you know, she, she's lovely, ran up and gave me a hug and I just put my hands up. You know, I was yeah, like, yeah. you know, because we're, we're at that point now is, 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 you know, in society, I guess, where, you know, if you're a male and you're anywhere near primary school age kids, you're just like, nope, yeah. <laughs> you know, and she's just being lovely and it's, you know, it's a sweet moment. But I mean, I told the teacher, I was like, you know, oh, We'll edit that. <laughs> you know, um, you know, ran over and uh, you know, ran over and hugged me because you just feel like if somebody saw that, like you, you panic. And why do we? It's a why real. Do we? Those rules are really twisted. I just and don't they, get it. They create so much. You know, so many of the problems of our society, I think, are and, and things like the disparity between how we behave and who we are, and all of those things. The greater the gap, the the the, the fear of 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 love, the the suspicion. I mean, I remember when when I was at that silly school. That when when they then brought girls, you know, joined it in, in the lower sixth, uh, you know, if you talk to girls, it was like, oh, yeah. And there was this thing which I'm not, I was trying to work out, it, it, you were called a spooner. And apparently spooner. that does still exist. So it's nothing to do with spooning as in the way it was like, you, yeah, it meant you, you talk to the girl. And it's like, oh my God, no wonder so many of our politicians are so awful. Is yes. You know, if you go through that system and it changes you, yeah. You're broken. How do you feel about private school? I, I don't. Like, I, I'd never send my son there. You I wouldn't. I, I, I believe in. Uh, um, I, I believe state education is. I believe we should be part of it. I believe that there's a huge battle ahead. I think that and and, and going on all the time. I think class size is ridiculous. I think you know you. It, it's not a good system. I mean, you were just in speaking to a school this morning, yeah. but um, slightly different schools. Was, was it a special needs school? Was no, that, it was like, kind was of. It, it was a school which is slightly more liberal in terms of the the baccalaureate that it does and all that kind of stuff. And like a Steiner. Uh, no, it wasn't. I can't remember what it was called, but it's it's a. Um, you know, and, and I'm always happy to go. You know, I often go to schools for again. It's one of those things that if I take enough jobs that I can, I can go. I can do all these things for free, so it's great. So I can go in. and it's and. I, again, I love that bit when when I go and talk to primary schools and the six year olds are just so open about so many. You know, they can ask anything, and and then we start closing ourselves down. Absolutely. You know? Well, my my six year old asked me the other day. Um, you know, the, the the eternal. You know, yeah, but how? Did, you know, what happened before the the Big Bang? Because you know, I can. I'm like, well, you know, it's observable. We can see the universe expansion. You know, we like red redshift. <laughs> and then she's like, yeah, but you know, that whole explains to me like I'm five, six. I'm like, I don't know. Like how do I? Well, how do you think? No one knows. How do you even start that? So that's what I did say. Do, I was like, nobody knows. There might have been nothing, <laughs> a, a total nothing, because there's no time and there's no space. If there's no time and there's no, which this is this is the problem that we have, which is to act, imagining nothing is impossible. Uh, so we always, like, even when we imagine nothing, we probably imagine blackness or we imagine something. And I love that. I love the fact that we have got to the point 
where, what's it now, 10 to the minus 37, 10 to the minus 38 of a second. So, I mean, that fraction of time, you think how many just in the time that we've been sat here, that fraction, you know. Uh, and the fact that we've got that far back and then you go, Ugh, that last 10 to the minus 38 is really tough nut to crack. And then you have that beautiful thing, which is talking to, to various physicists about this, which is, once something's got to change, because the reason that we don't understand it is you is you I'm sure you know, you know it's basically you've got quantum mechanics and gravity don't go together. So you just can't seem to get them. There's a point where you just go, ah. So gravity is from what most people that I've spoken to see, that gravity is going to have to be redefined and gravity is no longer going to be the thing. It'll be new. It's, it's that moment where when people say things like they go, oh, you know, I've often used this example, oh, Isaac Newton was wrong. And you go, Isaac Newton was right to a point, and that point included equations that got us to the moon. So it's wrong, At but it's time. good wrong. Mm -hmm. It's a really strong I mean, that's, wrong. You, you said we talked earlier on about you know the, the questions beget questions. You know, the, and that's what science is. It endlessly yeah. questions itself. It endlessly asks itself, "Is that right? Is that right?" Um, and that's the beautiful thing. Well, whenever it. people say science was wrong about that, I always then go, "Who found that out?" And then they have to go, "Some scientist." But it's like <laughs> so you get, and then you get, Newton, then you get Einstein, and then Einstein shows that the, the, the there's here Newton, Newton, Newton. Oh, now we need Einstein, and then it turns out that with gravity, it turned there will possibly be a point where you go, "Ah, and this." is where Einstein's gra the notion of gravity, you know, what we understand now about gravity, this is where it doesn't work anymore. Why doesn't I'm, it work? Just as a layman. I don't game. know. I genuinely can't. Uh, the idea of why quantum mechanics and gravity uh, don't work is something that I don't know. All I know is there is this point in time where you just go, you know, it's that bit where you sometimes get the flip round between space and time and time and space. And, and it's, uh, I mean, it's that whole thing of, I think, one of the things that people should know from a very early age is there's not space and time because you can't have space without time and you can't have time without space. So they that's why you get space time. That's you know, and the curvature of space, all of those things. Because I think that's why one of the most common questions when I used to talk with Brian that we would get is uh, what is the universe expanding into? Again, because visually we, well, like, we there must be something yeah. for it to expand into. And so that is, so when we start talking about, you know, it's, it's what Carl Sagan says, the cosmos masters, is everything there is, everything there was, and everything there ever will be, you know, all of that stuff, that is, it's not something you, and, and it's very important, I think, for people to know as well, who are not scientists like me, that scientists don't have a vision that goes, oh, you see, I can, they still, it's like the, the billions, Chris Lintock, the astronomer said to me, he said, I, I don't use too many numbers, he said, because then people start to believe that as an astronomer, I have a vision that they don't have. He said, but, you know, when he says a billion or 200 billion, whatever, he sees biggity, biggity, big. He sees really, really big. He doesn't see 200 billion. When he says there are 200 billion stars in our galaxy alone, he doesn't have a unique vision that is un inaccessible to you or I. Yeah. And I think that's quite an important thing. But yeah, I think those, and I remember the first time I talking on stage once about the idea that gravity will, you know, there's a point where gravity will kind of be disproved as, as what, or, or, you know, to, to a point. And I remember some people being nervous afterwards and then having to explain to them, no, it doesn't mean gravity will stop working. <laughs> it doesn't mean you suddenly go, oh, the scientists have disproved it. It's, oh, <laughs> you know, but that, it just means there'll be a new definition of what we understand yeah, of what we used to call gravity. Love that saying that if... Everything were to, you know, if, if all human knowledge were to, you know, ex um, cease to exist tomorrow, we would get back to this point again yeah. from a scientific perspective, in in a way that we don't from, wouldn't from a theological perspective. Yeah. We'd, we'd we'd create new religions and new gods and new new things, you know, inevitably. But we'd still get to the same answers and then to the same questions and to the yeah. same questions and then to another answer. And you know that that is comforting. And to your point about you know that we can't we can't imagine nothing. The whole what was there before I was born? God knows. What will there be when I'm not here? Doesn't matter. The same thing. That's that's it. You know, I don't need blackness. I don't need to get to the point of not understanding or you know questioning where am I going to be? What you know? What's this to do with a soul? And you know all that. Yeah. It's just like you know, I just I just cease to exist in the way that I wasn't existing before. And I, I, I used to have a that's nice, beautiful right, for me. Very, I like that. It's not scientific. It just I used to have this nice idea that when you died, what happened was that your soul, whatever you want to call it, your consciousness yeah. was no longer caged. So it left your skull and it goes, wow, I'm free. But of course it has no senses. And then of course, very quickly it dissipates. 
and suddenly and so you disappear because the, the the consciousness has spread out and then every now and again over the trillions of years of the existence of the universe it just happens that you come back like the Boltzmann brain you come back together and go oh I'm back and I'm and then off you go and of course that's not you know as far it's but I think that's the fun thing it's what Alan Moore's very good at you know writer of Watchmen of V Fantastic and all that which is there is a place where you're just allowed to play. And it's it's what I talk about, but one of the arguments that I sometimes have had with Brian Cox is um, there will be, like, if I say to him about, you know, do ghosts exist? He'd say, no, they don't. They break the second law of thermodynamics. I was waiting. I was wondering when. Yeah, the, the that, voice and that is, he always says, it doesn't sound anything like me. And it's, uh, <laughs> but it is, uh, and that to me is not the interesting question. The interesting question is not do ghosts exist by the laws of physics. It's the fact that ghosts do exist because they exist in our imagination. And we can walk around Gloucester and we can have, you know, you, you, you know much about the history of Gloucester. And there might be times where you just, you get a sense of all the layers of time that have existed before you. And for some people that will be interpreted as some kind of ghostly experience. The, your point about your dad's half-finished book. That's that's his existence there. You know yeah. that that's what's left. That, that, you know, not all that's left, but that's. Left. Um, there's a beautiful story about somebody is it from, from Reddit. Could be apocryphal. God knows, but um, that they they used to play video games with their dad, and he was fantastic. You know, we beat them all the time, and then he passed away. They went back to play it Mar Mario Kart or something, and you know, you get the ghost car where yeah. it's it's like you know you're you, you, um, it's the, the, the quickest lap. So um, you know he's following this ghost car. And he's trying to beat it. He's trying to beat it. And then at a point where he can almost beat it, he doesn't want to because that's what's left of his dad. And that, you know, brings a tear to your eye if you think about that, that the notion that that's, I mean, it's, it's quite, it's a visual representation of what his dad was. And there's, there's something, again, I've used the word beautiful a handful of times, but there's something really powerful about that. I think that that to me is what's left of us. It's, the, you know, those little, those little things, those little seeds of that's who that person was and that's where they exist. So, yeah, well, those little seeds. That's you know, going back to talking about doing the you know the the show about trees with Judy Dench. You know, Judy Dench sees in those trees, those trees planted in the memory of a late husband, of her friends, of Natasha Richardson, of all of those different things. She sees. It's one of the things that I love. I, I have a friend who whose uh, daughter died when she was a teenager, and she made sure that she was buried in one of those kind of wild burial because she wanted to see things growing. She wanted to see things growing out of where her daughter lay. And I think those things are, I was telling, here we go, I was telling Judy Dench <laughs> last night, but one of my favourite graves is I went around Nunhead Cemetery, which is a remarkable cemetery in South London, and there's one tomb that's split in two from a tree that grows out of it. And that sense, it's almost, you can project onto that, I'm not ready yet! Absolutely. And so... And I, and I find it's in the same way with the ghost. It's like, because my dad loved books as well, whenever I'm browsing, last few years of his life, he couldn't get out much. So I would buy books for him and I'd ring him up and I would have a conversation, which was not a conversation based around just checking you're okay. Yeah. I could say, oh, I'm just in this bookshop and I found this. And also I would be checking he was okay. That's how I'd be doing it. But it means that every place that I go, I will see a book and I'll go, that would be the one that I would have rung them about. And that's how long we live. We live as long as people, people retain us, on, you know? Know, Retain us in my memory, exactly. I mean, there's the, uh, what's, what's that saying? It's, um, you know, the wise man plants a tree whose shade he knows he never sits under. A lovely yeah. thing. And I mean, back in series one of this, I spoke to a guy called Mike McCarthy who founded the Baton of Hope. The Baton of Hope was at the time the largest um, Kind of um, suicide prevention campaign in the country. Um, it was a quite literal baton that they they did a relay, ended up at Parliament, uh, you know, Downing Street with it. And his son um, took his own life. And you know, he, but when they were children, he planted these trees. Um, so he, he uh, three children planted trees um, when when each of them were born. And that's how he remembers him. He said, sometimes I go out there and I touch the leaves, and it's like there is a communion with. And there's, you know, you don't need religion for that. And that's something that I think, you know, people are like, no, well, that's, that's God in it. That's the, and it's not, it's, it's just the humanity of it. And it's, um, it's, it's remarkable to hear people talk about, you know, exactly that, you know, how, well, how religion to... can remove that, you know, because religion to me, faith and religion are very different things. And and religion, you know that that thing that Alan Moore often talked about. You know the the idea it means to bind. It means a bunch of sticks, and, and it's kind of and so it, religion to me is very often a power thing. Whereas faith is, 
I, I, I think like I when I was up at the Stones of Kalanish, uh and I had it all to myself, and it was a beautiful sunny day in February, and uh, and I touched the hand stone there, and and I got a real you know wonderful sensation of all the people who might have stood there before, and the sense of that, and I think the emotional reaction I sometimes get, I get quite a lot of transcendent experiences. Because I just, I'm fascinated. Again, since I got rid of uh, anxiety, it gives me, you know, I can just look at a wall and I'll go, oh, I'll just suddenly think about all the people who laid the bricks and thought of the wall. Do you think blah, blah, blah. age gives you that? I, I think it can do, but I think it can also narrow you as well. I think it's that bit of as if you're prepared to keep progressing and you're prepared to keep walking into doubt, then you can find these things. And, and, and also, yeah, there's more that lies behind you than lies ahead. And I think that's, you know, kind of gives you a sense of the block universe of these moments of time. But I remember thinking, ah, I've realized what God is for some people. Because God, for it, it's not, hello, I'm on a throne. It's an emotional experience which their mind translates as some sense of a presence, which they say is a God. And for me, it doesn't happen, that translation. I get a beautiful transcendent feeling. And, but it doesn't get translated as, as, as God. I think there can be a narcissistic version. I think that level is literally, it's, I think it's where some of the atheists have got it wrong in some of their, their views. Again, the difference between religion and organisation. And, and the construct of power. And, 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 yeah, and th is that, for some people, it's not that their God has given them meaning. It's literally that they, well, it is, it gives them meaning, but it's not anywhere in what you might call the kind of like the rational I'm thinking mind. It's, it's an, an emotional, because I've got a friend, Carlos Frank, who is fantastic. He's uh, a cosmologist working on cold, dark matter up in Durham University. So intelligent. And I listened to him on the radio once. He talked about believing in God. And I was a bit surprised. And when I said, what, do you, do you believe in God? He said, yeah, no, I really believe in God. And uh, and then he said this great line, which I've used many times, where, where he said, uh, I believe in God, but I don't allow him into the laboratory, which I think is <laughs> so great. Um, he, But when we were talking about it, because during lockdown, we talked a lot, and he, and, and he went, you know, why does God have to be complex? And I went, right, so the God you believe in is nothing like the the god you know his god basically is kind of the very 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 first moment mm -hmm. and the cause of the universe but then everything else is the laws of physics and i said you see your god that then went on holiday is not the god that people are kneeling to yeah. necessarily and it's certainly not the god that people might be killing for any of those things um, so I think it's an intro. I, I, I was doing an interview. Do you know Sarah Perry who wrote The Essex Serpent? I don't know. She's really great, wonderful author. She's writing all these books and a lot of them are based around Essex and she's doing this. She's re-enchanting Essex. A bit like when we're talking about Gloucester, you know, the fact that people can, you know, everywhere that I go, doesn't matter where I go, I find something interesting and I know that there's, and it's that bit that maligned places can be re-enchanted with just a little story and her stories of Essex re-enchant Essex. And I was doing an interview with her and, and she used to be part of a religious sect when she was growing up. Those people are fascinating. Yeah. I, I've Hugely met a few fascinating. People, the ones who, the, the people who I stay with when I do the Hay Festival, I always stay at the same B&B, &B, lovely couple, and they were in a religious sect. And then when they had their first daughter, she suddenly went, I don't want my daughter growing up in this. Mm. But it takes, and I met another guy when I was out in Australia, someone who had been, it might have been Jehovah's Witnesses, which who were not quite as uh, just, just knocking on your door as people might think. Uh, in fact, if you want to know more about what a cult it can be, Deborah Francis White, who does The Guilty Feminist, has had, knows, can tell you much about that. But he, his way out was somehow he got cop a copy of an A.C. Grayling book of philosophy, which he kept hidden under his bed but which was the beginning of as long as you have control what you're reading, of the information. Porn. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. It was the philosophical porn. That was it. That's what he needed. What he needed to arouse him was an idea that said, I think you can build a door and you can leave. As long as you have someone controlling your belief of what the world is, and that whether that's organized religion, whether that's Stalinism, whether that's fascism, whatever it is, then that means you limited your roots and to me the most important thing is you should be able to take as many paths as possible and if you or say at least look at, or at least know they exist yeah exactly so you choose the path exist. but if you go um you're only allowed down this way yeah. otherwise you go past the other flowers but it was yeah sorry i was just gonna say sarah perry the first question i asked her was um 
when you did believe, who, what was your God? And she went, oh, I, no one's really asked me that. And I've, that's a very important question, I think, for, for atheists, agnostics, whatever, when you're talking to someone who, who is saying that they have faith, and uh, is, um, what is your God? Because it's, again, a bit like the ghost thing. There's no answer. If, if, if you just told me, oh, I believe in God, and I go, oh, okay, I've learned nothing. Absolutely. I, I want to know, because for a lot of people, the the idea of God is not a, a malignant, oppressive. It's only when you start to believe literal worlds. And more often than not, I don't think it's religion. I know I know Brian Cox talk, talked about this with me, the other Brian Cox when you had him on. I, I think the original Brian Cox, obviously. I'm like the professor. I call him the elder. Yeah. Like, Brian Cox, the elder. <laughs> but he, you know, I, I, I think the problem is that some people like Richard Dawkins imagined that if you got rid of religion, everyone would all be really cool and it would be great. I think the battle is against dogma. And dogma is very attractive to people because it says you can stop thinking. It says these are the rules. It gave us a framework. It gave us an understanding of the crazy world around us at a time before we could actually understand it, at a time before science came and asked another question. And, you know, the God of the gaps, right? That's yeah. the, the notion of that. Um it always blows my mind. The whole, you know, thousands of gods, you know, you just, I just believe in one fewer than you do. Um, you've heard all this before because it's like Gervaisisms, right? Yeah. You know, Hitchens um, and, and, and Dawkins, you know, the, the notion of the four horsemen. Um, I, I love Hitchens, but a tiny bit cringe. You know, the, yeah, that, that, there is a point as well where he loved, I think he enjoyed arguing more than and he's the bloody good at it. Kindness. Yeah, he really was. And I remember seeing him at the Hay Festival and he was so antagonistic when he didn't need to be. Right. And I think that's the difference. That's is. where, maybe we're post that now. I read a piece yesterday, a friend of mine sent it to me about kind of being, you know, in, in that post- aggressively atheist like we, we need to get past that because you know if, if we all just admit that we're probably agnostic uh yeah. you know as in you know people that are truly i'm an atheist it's like well how can you be um you know if somebody tells me they can levitate i'll believe them when i see it you know and yeah. that's that's the, the, the you know that the fact of the matter is i'll believe it if i see it I'll, and if i'm you know if it's demonstrated to me you know everything that we've talked about in terms of physics can be explained to me in a rational way can be shown to me can be you know, here's how we got there and that's that's all we ask, right? Yeah, is, I didn't become an atheist or an agnostic or whatever out of any intellectual. That it just was, you know, that it was just there, and it means so little to me because it, it is. It just again, like it goes back to that thing. It, it just gives me more options. I, you know, I never think, you know, wake up in the morning, over, you know, what, what would not God do? <laughs> you know, it's not what it, it is. It's and and then I think that bit of work because I used to get asked sometimes to go the, the what's it called Greenbelt Festival that used to be in Cheltenham, and you know, it's it's a, it's a Christian. Festival festival and I remember you know being asked to do it and I did it on a few occasions met some lovely really wonderful people you know real liberal and and political activists and people who were totally open to you know all that so you know unfortunately religion on in the media is predominantly represented by the very worst people because that's clickbait you know and, and so you'd have all those Sunday morning shows with really horrible people it's a bit like you know with at the moment with 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 Gaza and and what's going and 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 we focus on on at extremes and um, it means that you dehumanise. You, you're in danger of dehumanising so many people, whether it's the Palestinian people, whether it's the Jewish people. And that really, you know, we should be seeing more. My, uh, Dave Cohen, who's a lovely comedian and writer, and, and you know, I, I saw him and he said, well, you know, his local synagogue and his local mosque are doing loads of work together. And that is not an exciting story. And we know that in Israel there's a lot of Israelis and Jewish Israelis who are appalled by the war. But we, they're not given much representation. And we know that in Palestine there are people who are not, you know, supporters. Yeah, you know, all of that stuff is and and that, that you know, I think so much of our world has a fear of complexity. And it's not that it's difficult. People will often go, well, it's too difficult to understand. No, 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 it's not too difficult to understand. It just takes a little bit longer. I'm gonna remove this certainty, and that means I have to think about. Why am I, you know, that one of the questions, question time, you never get on question time. Someone will say something outrageous. And what I want to always hear is, why do you say that? Yeah. No, explain. Because I, I see that all the time. You know, you've seen it a lot with those things that go up on TikTok of Trump supporters being interviewed. You know, Joe, Joe Biden's just evil. He, he, you know, he's done so many terrible things. What terrible things he done? You know, what terrible things hasn't he done? No, but what terrible things he done? And that's the thing is, it's like at the moment we're recording this, obviously, I don't know when it's going to happen, but, you know, the, the election uh, is happening in the UK. And when I hear people, when I hear Lee Anderson talk about we want our country back, right, the first thing you say is 
Who do you want your country back from and why? You don't just let them say that. And when someone says British values, you say, what are British values? And when they say, well, fairness, you go, well, it's not fairness, is it? Because you believe this, this and this. And it's not fairness if you look at what we did there in colonialism. And it's not fair when you look at the way the workers were treated. It's not fair when you look at the Peterloo massacre. It's not. So so stop letting people use emotional sound bites and, and without any sense of definition. And, and and I think that's one of the great advantages that comes from, you know, again, comes from agnosticism is useful for this. ADHD and neurodivergency is useful for this. You don't take anything as read. Everything is a question why. Mm. And it is... Because we lose that, don't we? We get that kind of beaten out of us a little bit, not yeah. physically necessarily. But, you know, that, that, you know, but why? Again, talking about my children, you know, every one of them, it's, you know, some say it's just like, but why? And then you're like, because it is. You know, yeah. because because I don't have that, any more access exactly for you, right? That's exactly how, um, like the school this morning, I was talking about, you know, for, for anyone, you know, neurodivergent listening or watching to this, the, the, the you know, the things at school, stop fidgeting, look me in the eyes when I'm talking to you. Well, actually, for a lot of people, looking people in the eyes is extremely difficult, if not almost impossible. And fidgeting is actually part of stimming and it's part of it. And it doesn't mean, like, like for me, for instance, I normally am doing more things than one. Because if I just do one thing, like I was chatting to someone who they're, they're autistic, autistic son um, has gone to university and has to read a book while being in the lecture because if he only does one thing the brain eventually goes which is what I find but if I'm actually so sometimes I might be doing something on my phone and people think you're not listening and I go I'm taking everything in I really am it's just that I need to be so all of those separate rules where you go what why why do we have this rule and if it is just because, well, it just makes everything easier. Conformism. It and needs to conform- make things better, Conformity in systems exists because there are many of us, right? And we need to get, like, systems, like like school. I've talked about this before. School is not a perfect system, but it's the best we've got. Mm. And, you know, that's the, 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 the fact is, if, if somebody can come up with a better system, then, you know, we'd run towards it. But, you know, I, I guess that's what... There is a better system, though. What is it? It's just financially not done, which is the better system is, first of all, all class sizes are 10 people. 10 to 12 people, right? You get that. That's why, why private education has a huge advantage is because the all of those kids nobody get more the, attention. Nobody's sieved. Yeah, and there's all of that stuff. And that's why, you know, and that's, again, why I totally believe in positive discrimination. Whenever I hear people, well, I mean, the thing that worries me is a lot of the rich white children aren't able to get into Oxford anymore. And you go, do you know what? There's still a good number. There's still a good number. And, and I meet so many people who have slipped through the system who have amazing minds. Like I was, I was doing a, a, a talk on a boat on the River Orwell. There was a 72-year-old guy there who basically, he had to leave school when he was 14. He hadn't really properly been to school, to be honest. You know, reading and writing and all those things were, were luck. You know, it really was. It was like a lot of, not going to sound like a Monty Python sketch, but it kind of was. that He got through without knowing those things. And now, at 72 years old, he, he done, he's done a writing course and he's written a short story and it's got into a competition and it's gone really well in there. And, and in the same way, you know, when I visited prisons, um, some of the people that I meet when they went into prison could not read or write. Mm-hmm. And I remember being in Leicester prison and one of the guys really wanted to read me his poem. There was a lockdown and he said, oh, oh please, can I read Robin my poem before? And he read this poem and it was a good poem. It wasn't W.H. Auden, but it wasn't bad. It wasn't like it was a good... And I thought, he's now got a a weapon he never had before, which is, you know, for for so many of us, it's one of the reasons that I say to people, if you can write, write, write. Because for me, the experience of writing is some of the things that I've written about, like the car crash and stuff, which I'd never talked about. Another Suddenly, when you place something on a page, it allows you to interrogate it and deal with it in a way that you've never been able to do before. And so, and what this guy has found is neat. He is now, all those thoughts, it's a bit like, again, a diagnosis for neurodivergence. What I think often happens is before there was chaos and it just keeps reaching out to the universe, when you have, whether it's a self-diagnosis or official diagnosis or just your own new understanding, it creates a box around you. So the chaos still goes, but then it hits a wall where you go, I know what this chaos is. As long as, for me, my... My thoughts around that are as long as then it's not, as long as there's still some positivity and it's, you know, okay, how do I take 
a diagnosis and still be, you know, still move positively with that rather than allow it to define you? Well, it's your diagnosis. That's the first thing. It's your possession of it. You do what you need to do with it. So I know, for instance, I was talking to a woman who said, now that I've been diagnosed with autism, I don't tell everyone at work, but whenever the Christmas party comes up, I say, oh, I can't do that. I'm autistic. It's too many people. So she, you know, she doesn't really want to go then. It's not a place she feels comfortable. And you're quite right. And it's not, the trouble is that people see it all as demands and it's not really demands. It's such slight things it's actually the main thing is I think for a lot of us is it gives you like my understanding now of the fact that because a lot of a lot of neurodivergent divergent issues are involved in the prefrontal cortex it's basically your neural pathways there your working memory uh emotional control very often is not what people might think it should be uh, whether should is the right way, I'll say that. Yeah. But so I now understand when I suddenly get huge amounts of frustration, the fact that I also understand that, like when I was saying about interviewing Sarah Perry, basically I was writing at home and I thought I'll just check on tomorrow's event in Chelmsford. And I checked on it and it was today's event in Chelmsford in 80 minutes time. I don't drive. I live 60 miles away from Chelmsford. I have to get there as fast as possible. And so for 10 minutes... I was so filled with uncontrollable self-hate and fury of that. 80 minutes time. Sarah, one of the things that I find really fascinating, and at 80 minutes, I could create an interview that with a f only a few clues, because I hadn't prepared the interview. I was going to do that the next morning. I was able to have a 90-minute conversation uh, where all... so. My, my bad, you know, the bad side of the prefrontal cortex and the way it works was when something happens to me, it can really, really emotionally, it can create... Uh, but the good side of it is also is the equipment, which means I can then sit with you or anyone else and just go... Vum, 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 vum. Oh, I'm going to take that, I'm going to take that, I'm going to take that. And that's why all my answers have been so confusing. Which is wonderful. <laughs> Let's jump around then. Why science? Where, where did you come in at, like... So you, you, you weren't trained as a scientist. No. You didn't go down that path. No. So where, I won't have the focus. So That's where the did that curiosity come from? Because, again, you started the Infinite Monkey Cage in, uh, oh, Christ, what was it, 2009? 2009, I think. 2008 or two. Yeah, it might be. Right. Two. It is, so, yeah. I mean, it's now. So, we're nearly up to 200 episodes. So it's, how it's, did uh, you go from comedy, writing, performing, all, all of those things, poetry, to, to that? Like, you know, what, what, what brought about that kind of pairing of you and Brian? Do you know what part of it was? So I loved stand up, I loved comedy, and then I, I did quite well in the first year. And then I really lost focus and I probably drank too much and various other things. And um We'll come back to and, that actually. I'm interested. Yeah, and then and then I just kind of I thought, hang on a minute, what do I well, one of the things was I I did a show about this last year at the Edinburgh Fringe, uh, which was called Melons, which would open with me repeatedly punching a melon and shouting about Vernon Kay before singing Mustang Sally. I'm sure it'll be prime time soon. And <laughs> Netflix, uh, where are you? It was so much fun to do because on even on the last night, as I was punching the melon, I heard a woman go, Are you sure we've come to the right show? <laughs> and then and I had such a blast doing it. And it was a it was a passionate show all about why I loved comedy and how I fell back in love with it. And when I did that show, it was a, a, a failure for 90% of people. But the 10% who liked it, loved it, I really got what it was. And it made me realise what I was doing wrong. I had tried to shape myself into what I thought I was meant to be as a comedian. I guess, is, was, was this post-touring with Ricky? No, it was the same time. So that because, was also because you're a reminder. Because seeing, you're seeing somebody that is very, like, you know, it's it's a, it's a broader potential base of people, right? You're seeing, you know, okay, well, this is immensely popular. And do you think that you almost went down or tried to go down a more populist kind of com comedy think, route? Or I just think I did boring things. I think I did jokes that were just jokes or whatever. It didn't mean right. anything. I think I'd lost. I don't think I'd really worked out. And then I did this silly show and... And then I, I started, I created a show called The Book Club where I would just have really, you know, wonderful, bizarre and eccentric acts on. And again, a very celebratory thing. And the first thing I said on the very first night of The Book Club is I said, tonight you're going to see lots of acts trying out new things and doing things they've never done before. And yeah. some of them you might not enjoy, but it's very important for you to remember, if you're not enjoying them, that you're the one who's wrong. I wanted to reset <laughs> that idea that, you know, 
because I've met comedians, you just, you just got to go out there and tell them what they want. It's like, that's why be a comedian if you're going to do that? Why be any form of artist if you're delivering what you, you know, it's, it's under you know, that idea of, I remember doing a gig in, in Bristol and the compare went on and right at the beginning, there's a young couple in the front row and he's, he's going, oh, you're quite young. Have you fingered her yet? And all this stuff. And afterwards, I said, why were you doing that? They went, it's what they want. I said, but they didn't want it because when I walked on, the first thing I did was reset the rules because I could see that. And if you go on and always presume the worst, and it's what we see in the media all the time, the media so underestimates people's curiosity and intelligence and, and the excitement. So anyway, sorry, it's long, but so I started doing that. And then I thought, as well as doing this silly show, I thought, oh, I'm going to celebrate the books I really love. And I'd started reading science again. And I started thinking a lot of people like me got to a point where they uh, education made science a very boring thing, yeah, a set of absolutely. numbers, and none of the stories were there. And so I thought, oh, do you know what? What if I make a show where there's musicians and comedians that people are coming along, and then I'll just sneak in an epidemiologist and a particle physicist? And so that was the starting point in kind of the, the middle of the first decade of this century. And then I started putting on uh, – at the end of the show got bigger and bigger – and then I, I I did a few theatre shows with it, and then that's what led to and I did one show with Brian, and then we ended up just making Monkey Cage in the first couple of series. Of, of, I mean, that's quite, that's quite a jump to go from hey, I just met this guy, you know, we were just chatting um, like we are now, to then ah, actually we're going to do this other show that that's going to last. Yeah, I don't think Radio <laughs> Four had any time. big ideas of it. I think you know they didn't want to call it Infinite Monkey Cage; they wanted to call it Top Geek. So that's why I came up with Infinite Monkey Cage as a so title fun. because I was like, no, nah, and I'm really glad. Yeah, I, I sat in my mate Carl's house in Levensum and just wrote every possible title. And the Infinite I, Monkey you know, Cage. Do you know I'm I'm in, I'm in the middle of that right now with this podcast. It's going well. It's doing you know, it's doing fantastically. Guests are great. You know, views, listens are good. But I'm I'm thinking format. You know, um, you know, things like that, and and you know, I'm, I'm thinking maybe the name needs, you know, needs some work. I don't know. Do, do, you know, when you just get that creative doubt, you're like, yeah. hang on, is this what, what it needs to be or where it's it needs really to be? Really hard to, because I do think that since the Infinite Monkey, I think people have got more and more specific in saying this is what it is. Yeah, which it's I think is a great pitch. The science people... and technology podcast talking. Yeah, about, yeah, 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 yeah. And that was science. Do, hour. do you know what it is? It's, it's discoverability. It's yeah, yeah. like like kind of. SEO and uh, you know like search engine optimization and you know the, the notion of of finding something because if I went onto the podcast app now and I wanted to find I know a, a science podcast there's probably Science Daily or something yeah, like that yeah. do you know what I mean so you type in science and up, up that pops and you know it, it takes away some of the creativity from it. it means that some people that you could or potentially should be listening to get completely thrown. To the yeah, it's very case. difficult to work. I, I think there is, you know, it's, it's like when, when I, I, I think you just have to, you have to make it and you have to work out as many ways as possible where with keeping all your integrity. And that's it. It's being honest with it because, yeah. you know, I was speaking to friends the other day about, you know, you think um, like branding is enormously important. Again, I'm a PR man. You know, I know that I'm not an idiot. Um, you know, you, you think of all the people that like, the, the, you know, the naked chef. Yeah. Who, was, who was Jamie Oliver before the Naked Chef? You know, he morphs it. He becomes that, you know, the, the hardest geezer, the guy, Russ Cook. Yeah. The, the, you know, so these monikers, they, they matter because people glom on to that schema, to that notion of, oh, okay, that's who that, he's the guy that does the thing. So, you know, I'm thinking of that, but it has to retain some integrity and honesty. You know, I can't just be like, oh, I'm Rich, the bloke that wears a cowboy hat. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, I'm not, yeah. what, why, why? You know, um, so yeah, that's kind of where I am with that right now. But the Infinite Monkey Cage, well done for not going for Top Geek. Um, we both yeah. borrowing and me just went no yeah it will alienate those who'd like it and it will attract those who won't yeah it was it was the antithesis That's a great of shout. uh yeah it, there was no you know it was before brian became famous I mean, it was quite funny because brian basically became famous over kind of i think probably series three and, and, and that was i remember doing cheltenham science festival and saying to brian uh you can't stop now when you take a telephone call because he hadn't noticed i said if, as long as you keep moving, you'll be fine. But if you stop, you stop for long enough for someone to go, oh, God, I'm going to go up and get a selfie. And then that means everyone goes up. Yeah. So it kind of – but that, that was an interesting thing to see. I, I'm, I love the fact that we have, you know, scientists and, and people that, that are, quote, unquote, famous. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a fantastic thing, I think, in society where it's not just you – know, I think we've – we've moved away in the last decade or two from people like fame for fame's sake. You know, it was there, wasn't it? It was really there. I mean, I think um, some, of the, um, you know, some of my team was talking about Love Island the other day. And, you know, the 
it's, I think I, I don't know about viewers or anything like that. And it's not a, it's not a, a snobby thing to say. I've not watched a minute of it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just, it's not for me, but I think that we're moving away from that. I'm going to be famous or I'm, I want to pursue fame as a, you know, rather than be a byproduct of success, talent, hard work, um, you know, all of those things uh, being entertained and interesting. It's, I'd like to think that we're in a place now where it's wonderful that we got somebody like, you know, yourself, someone like Brian, that's there for intellectual integrity as opposed to getting your kit off. Well, we need more of that. I mean, that's the problem is I think television itself is is that they seem to still be going down that route we've just been talking about. And actually, if they were, you know, there's so many great communicators of science and they're not getting their shows made and some of them will go off to some streaming platform or whatever. We need more. Again, it's we're underestimating the audience all the time. And there are, I see it, yeah, every time I do a free gig in a library and I see such a broad number of people there who are interested in so many things, um, we're not giving them that. We, and we're also doing that stupid thing in documentaries where um, you keep recapping. You go, you don't need to recap because the way we watch things now, we can rewind. Yeah. Everyone can Trust rewind. us. Yeah, you yeah. Know, have, have yeah. some belief so, in so your audience. If we, or you do something and they go, oh, can you explain what that word means? And you go, well, that's going to look patronising. And also, it's never been easier just to pick up your phone and go, I wonder what that word means. You've got a library in your hand and we're dealing with it. So yeah, I, I think you're right. I think we still need to be pushing it. We need more scientists in politics. We need, you know, we, we need more people whose education is not hedge fund management. So with, I mean, that's a really good way of putting it. Um, because I mean, I guess that's what we've got, right? We've just got people whose backgrounds are, um, as, you, as you say, private school, elite, yeah, hedge fund, you know, financial, and, and then all of a sudden they're supposed to run a country. Um, you know, with no actual understanding of how. Yeah, and, and with only people. one key, you know, that, which is how much money can we make off this? Yeah. And it's not even how much money do you make for society. It's like, as we know, the the, the creaming off of profit, The you know, that old line about socialism for the rich and capitalism for the poor has never been truer than it is in, in this country. AI. Yep. How do you feel about AI right now? I think AI is very... I, I, I think we're probably... The, the problem will not be AI. The problem will be those who have the power to use it most. It's, a, it's again, it's a problem of capitalism rather than the problem Which of was technology, my, I think. My question, I guess, is do you think technologists, do you think technology companies even, are quite secretly happy with the notion of AI being demonized because then it allows them to wave a hand over there and, oh, AI over here, and, yeah. you know, from a regulatory perspective or otherwise, get away with certain things that they probably would prefer other people didn't see. From a, you know, and I speak specifically about things like, you know, retention of attention of our children, yeah. uh, you know, things that, you know, are markedly, provably not good for our children or, you know, or, or society as a whole, but they're like, ah, let's let the boogeyman du jour be, be AI. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, people have kind of gone straight ahead to imagining that Hal's going to be there going, no, Dave, you know, and it's like kind of a 2001 year. And, and I don't think that, again, any of the bad things that happen will happen due to those who are controlling it. Not, you know, we, we've turned, as you said, into a boogeyman. It's like, kind of, oh, AI bad. No, human bad. Human, you know, the capitalism, where it's in the same way, you know, this fascinating thing, which is saying, you know, the previous industrial revolution made it far difficult for, you know, workers, the working class, and that was, you know, the remove. And this one is actually one that's going to affect the middle class. Who was it put up something the other day about, uh, I can't remember, it said, I thought AI was going to do uh, my... Um, washing, iron, yeah, ironing. Washing and ironing. Well, it gave me more time to write a novel and do painting. But actually, it turns out that's going to do the, the painting and I've got to do more. And, and I thought that is, again, these what we need to battle against is the corporations that will be finding shortcuts to save money so they have greater profits. And I think the interesting thing in terms of on the creative level with AI... At the moment, this might be extremely naive, but I am quite naive, is I think in some ways it's a bit like, I, I view it as being like photography, which is when photography came along, you know, painters suddenly went, oh, oh, Ansel Adams is taking a picture of this um, canyon. So I, I used to paint those. And then you see this incredible revolution of artistic creativity. You know, whether it's cubism, whether it's surrealism, you know, all of those, you need dardrism, you know, whatever it might be, which is, which photography could be part of, but art, you know, it wasn't just click. And I, I don't mean to simplify because obviously photography is, you know, an art. Um, and I think that's the same with AI. I mean, like I was doing a gig in Sutton Coldfield the other day, which was particularly frenetic. I was extremely energetic and my, my brain was bubbling. And and at one point I just paused and I went, AI won't be able to do this. And I think, you know, there's that thing which I, I, I've, I've, you know, rather snuffly said on, on Monkey Cage in the past is AI will be able to replicate Jimmy Carr uh, because, you know, an algorithmic artist 
eventually you own. But, I mean, I do a society of authors, which I'm a member of. You know, I voted against my work being used to develop AI. And I, I think I think there's a lot of a lot of what we see as AI is, is still a kind of elaborate cut and pasting job from it human is. minds. Yeah. No, I mean, it's useful. I always say it's, it's a, you know, you can use it and we do use it, you know, professionally. It's, it's you know, um, it is as good as a, a half decent intern. You know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 you know, it's no more complex than that for me right now. I think, you know, for us to say, it's, I don't think it does away with any artists or anything like that, as you said. And, you know, and, and you rightly say, you know, photography existed and will continue to exist. And the problem here is, it's the people that might just be entering an industry. Let's say, let's take design, illustration or whatever. I can now use AGI or, you know, uh, you know GPT, whatever, to, um, to create mock-ups and images that are obviously, you know, standing on the shoulders of the other images that came before it, where previously I would have maybe put that to an artist. I would have previously. So I, because I'm, 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 again, endlessly optimistic. So I think things like, well, you know, farriers were probably not too, none too pleased when the steam engine came in. You know, they found new jobs. They, they probably worked on the steam engine. And a friend of mine pointed out, he's like, no, 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 this, there's not a job for them to go into. You know, there's because they have to completely retrain. You know, if, if that's what you did and, you know, you mocked up, um, you know, images for marketing or branding or whatever, and that was a job, well, you know, basically that's a whole swathe of people that have been taken out of the job market that now need to find something else. And that's only going to kind of continue to happen as, you know, I, I can't remember which business it was now, but I saw, I saw that they you know, saved six million this year already or something like that on marketing because they're using this. It's like you haven't saved six million. You've just not paid somebody six million. You know, yeah, you've not yeah. paid people six million. Well, that again, that's the, what the real problem is: the value system, which says is profit for the few. That that's not to you know. I I think that whole problem of not viewing a society, like you know, I was saying about you know wandering around here. And and I see the people who probably previously would have been looked after and are now, you know, what used to be called care in the community. You see all of these things which ha are, are framed around, oh, this is a very good idea and it's going to improve that. And it's not about improving. It's about maximizing profit for a very small number of people. Yeah. And we're far too obsessed with that. And we don't, the trickle down effect is absolute bold dash. So we, we know that's, there's, there's no evidence for that. Uh, if you get rich enough, you work out every single different scheme to not pay tra you know, tax properly. Um, and I don't understand, I also don't understand being really wealthy. I have to admit, it's something that I don't get why you would want to have nine houses and a helicopter. It's just not in my value system. I don't, there's a point, I, you know, I, I've talked to, I wrote about this in the big issue recently. Yeah, I live in a Goldilocks zone. The Goldilocks zone that I currently live in is I make enough money to choose what I want to do. Yeah. So I don't have a big house. I don't drive a car. Uh, I, but I'm able to pay all my bills. I'm able to go around a shop without worrying too much about, you know, I can stick that in my basket. I don't have to go. I better put the mayonnaise back because that now has given me freedom. Whereas if I kept wanting to make more money, then you end up having to go to that restaurant, this cycle. restaurant and this champagne and that champagne or whatever. Financial security was all I cared about. Yeah. That was the thing. It's, because once you're financially secure, you can make good decisions. Um, yeah. Bad decisions are made when you're not financially secure. I've seen it again. You know, my my upbringing was one where you know you would you know, debt collectors might come and take things, right? Um, and you know, we used to like quick turn the lights off and lie on the floor, yeah. <laughs> you know that sort of thing, right? But good decisions don't get made when you're constantly worried about oh, do we have enough? You know, is the emergency electric going to go? You yeah. know, are we going to oh, are we going to sit here in the dark? It's only when financial security comes in. That's not always easy to attain. But you're absolutely right. Just you know, having the freedom to make your, your own choices, both creatively, but also you know, I mean, again, you know, the person down the mine isn't going home and painting; they're knackered, yeah. you know. And again, figurative. Nobody's down the mine, but some of them are it, the pitmen painters. The pit, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I know, and it is. Yeah, I think that whole thing of the, this is the the bit the the moment you you realise you are in such a tiny percentage of people, as I realise that I. Uh, predominantly only do things that I'm interested in doing. I enjoy almost my whole life uh, and I'm financially secure. And you go, right, I'm, I'm in such a tiny percentage of people. It's crazy, isn't it? When you yeah. think about it and you look at people and, you know, again, I, I think of my family and I think of financial security and I think if only I could, you know, you can't give that to somebody. Yeah. I can't pick it up and go, here's one financial security, enjoy it. You know, you've kind of got it. It's, it's hard to get to yourself. I mean, at what point did you feel like you could make decisions based on, what you wanted to do and not what was going to pay the bills? 
And I guess you came from you know, going to Chapman College and things like yeah, that. I don't no, want to I assume. Mean, it, it's what one of you the things that I think a, a lot of, of uh, middle class people and beyond don't realise. The difference you have in never having experience, as you said, you know, the 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 bailiff coming around and and that into the difference that you have. The number of options, it's like, you know, that whole thing of people who are very wary of doing further education because, oh, what is that? What's the financial mm. reward now? You know, which I wouldn't is, have done it. I didn't. That, yeah. I, you know, I, I, it's I so just, precarious. It terrifies me. The idea of debt terrifies me because of what I've seen. See, I have that. That's my thing is I, I never go into debt. I, I, apart from having a mortgage, that was it. Mm. Uh, my dad was very specific in, in terms of, of living within your means. And and I don't think I probably realised, you know, to be comfortably off, to uh, and and I wish more people would accept that because that's why my friend Josie Long runs Arts Emergency, which is great. I absolutely love Arts Emergency. Yeah, I've donated it, to the, you know, yeah, yeah, it's it's, and, and it's that thing of going until we. Re everyone is not people. I think people make the mistake of going. Well, I'm kind of living the average life of everyone. And when I was growing up, I wasn't living the average life of, of everyone. And no one's living the average. And that bit where you go, hang on a minute, and, and it's, you shouldn't be ashamed. Again, going back to that kind no, of Lawrence No, absolutely thing. shouldn't be. You don't have to be ashamed. No. You have to acknowledge it. It's in that same way that people go, oh, my God, they're making us feel guilty about everything. You don't have to feel guilty when we're dealing with misogyny, when we're dealing with transphobia, when we're dealing with racism, whatever it might be. It's not about making you feel guilty. It's about making you acknowledge and go, it should be better. Because that person has had to struggle a lot more than I've had to struggle. And uh, and it doesn't mean, you know, what I'd always say is everyone struggles because being human a is a struggle. It's filled with it's our human condition. anxiety. You know, You've that's... never met a person yeah. that hasn't had to meet a challenge and either, you know, overcome it or, you know, kind of allow yeah. it to, to wash over the It just means there's not, there's not parity in the struggle. Yeah. There are, you know, that's that intersectionalism and all of those things, which is to say, look, it's a very, very complex, but... Don't say I'm on the same, you know, well, we're all a bit like that. You know, blah, blah, blah. Well, no, other people have different struggles. And it doesn't mean that you are negated. And you go, oh, well, I suppose it, it's a narcissism, is it? What I mean, you see that with all of those Trump people and things like that. You know, well, by Trump people, I mean Donald Trump. Yeah, you know, that whole kind of, I think you'll find I'm the real victim here. And that whole thing, is, it's like self-pitying people never have the room to have pity for anyone else. And that politics is, is that self-pitying. That you know, empathy is is enormously missing in those kind of people, right? And yeah. I mean, do you know what the f my favourite videos are the ones where they say, oh, can you believe that uh, Biden said this? And then, they're like, oh, what a reprehensible. And then uh, and then they say, oh, actually it was Trump. And they're like, well, I'm sure he meant this. And, yeah, you know, they, yeah. you know the, the kind of you know moral and uh, intellectual gymnastics, allegedly intellectual gymnastics they must do to try and then, you know, say, no, actually, this, I'm sure this is what Trump meant when he said, you grab her by the pussy. It's yeah, like, oh, oh yeah, no, cool. Uh, anyway, I mean, so we, amazing. Yeah. US politics, is, it blows my mind. It is entertainment now. And that's, you know, I remember when Trump was first elected, um, you know, I, I just was like, this is going to be chaos. Uh, but, but like, you know, we're all going to watch it. It's like a car crash you can't take your eyes from. Um, but well, the entertainment thing is a very important thing for people. I don't think people seem to realize. There's a great book called Amusing Ourselves to Death by uh, uh, Neil Postman, which came out in the early 80s, uh, which is about how everything is turned into entertainment. And then there was a, uh, another book written by Chris Hedges. I've forgotten the name. I remember being out in New York and reading it before Trump had actually got the presidential nomination. And it started with a bit about Trump. This was 10 years before but about the way that all of our political communication in the US now was done in the style of basically a wrestling match. Yeah, I mean, it is. And, that, and that's what it is. And, and this is what people don't realise about the news as well. People think of the news as a factual outlet, as opposed to it's about entertainment and it's about viewing figures. Um and and then you you know and and I don't mean uh, but yeah that's why I use alternative news websites because most of those we'll still are have also a bias, monetized and about fi finance but the moment that you think there is some superiority in the non-domicile owned newspapers which you know I always find whenever I'm abroad and it, look back and see what is in the newspapers in the UK I go oh my god Stalin would blush at this level of propaganda am amongst a lot of them you know and. But that bit of just having, and it's a scepticism. You just go, hang on a minute, why is it? Because I'm sure all of us have had something where we've been involved in a story or, you know, on a march, whatever, and you know what actually happened. And then you read that version of events. There's, what's it called? Do you know about Gelman Amnesia? 
Murray Gell-Mann, the physicist, he, he would say that, you know, if he got to a newspaper article about physics, he'd go, well, that's not right. Well, that's not the year that happened. That's not why we, we're researching that field. That's all wrong. And then he turned the page and go, oh, that's very interesting about that. And he'd go, well, hang on a minute. What is the likelihood that the only subject they don't know about just happens to be the subject that I know about? Mm. If that article about what I know about is predominantly wrong, then do you know what? Page five is probably predominantly wrong and page six. And that bit of every time, you know, that, that scepticism I think is really important because we've been so misled so many times. And unfortunately, so many newspapers are, they have the least curiosity, the least compassion. You know, I found, a friend of mine found a copy of the Sunday Mirror from the 31st of August, 1997, which was the day... The day that, Diana. Yeah. yeah. So what happened, I don't know if you know this story, right? So, so all of the, the, the Sunday newspapers are printed very, very early, used to be printed very, very early. So all the newspapers to the northeast of England and Scotland had gone already. Right. Now, the whole of that month, the newspapers had focused on saying that Diana was a uh, stupid uh, betrayal. The affair uh, with she Dodie was having and, sex with yeah. you know, all of these things. It was really vicious. Now, of course, all the papers that went to the northeast and Scotland still had those front pages and all that. Now, this copy of the Sunday Mirror obviously went to the southeast because they'd managed to change page one, two, and three. But then you get to the columns, and there is <laughs> Carol Malone, regular on the Jeremy Vine show, and various others basically saying what an awful, stupid woman who should shut her face. Now, Carol Malone writes articles going, Megan thinks she's Princess Diana. Well, she's not. And you go, no, she is, because you're perpetually writing rude and unpleasant and awful things about her. And if she does suddenly die in a car crash, you'll go, Megan was the queen of our hearts. Oh, and, and, and to me, that's that. When you look back and you go, this perpetual victory over your own memories. Yeah. This refusal to ever acknowledge your mistakes, this entire lack of, you know, I, I see so little humility in the newspaper industry and so much Wait, judgment. Do you know what? They sh there should be some humility again looking. But anyway, we digress. Are you writing anything right now? Uh, what am I writing at the moment? I'm writing, a, uh, as well as the regular big issue column, I'm writing a, a new book which is going to be called uh, Normally Weird, Weirdly Normal. Okay. Which is taking me a very long time. It uh, should have been out this year. It's not going to be out this year. <laughs> I'm gonna, the, the, have you got publishers on your case about it? Or? No, they were very kind. They said, I've got an idea. Why don't we bring it out in spring? Thank you very much. <laughs> and and it's because it's about, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make it for as broad an audience as possible in terms of exposing lots of things that people think are weird in themselves. So a lot of it is actually about um, ADHD and autism and the lack of understanding and how we can change the world to make it uh, a much better place for people who very, you know, can very often have remarkable abilities but find them very hard to, to in the situation they're put in. And about and it's about trauma and the prefrontal cortex and all manner of things. But it's one of those ones where I really want one of my favorite things is when someone after a show feels freer to be alive than they did before and uh, that like you know when someone well my, my show on radio for reality tunnel you know the first reaction to it one of the people wrote to me who was in their 60s and said i always thought there was something wrong with my brain and the way it just makes all these connections and all of these thoughts and i keep kept it all hidden for my whole life because i thought i must just be mad and i just heard your show and i realized that i'm not the only one mm. there might be loads of us and if not there's two of us you know and that's the thing where so i want to get that I want the book to be as useful as possible to the largest number of people who, as we know, so many people... It's when I, when I wrote the book I'm a Joke and So Are You was my, one of my first realisations that the number of people who felt they could come up to me and tell me, you know, be, be very... Tell me incredibly honest things about their life, which is one of the things that I love about performing is I think, I hope, the audiences that come see me, they trust me and, you know, they they there's people I've become friendly with and there's people who... And I want, you know, I, I really want people to feel happier to be alive because when I wrote I'm a Joke and So Are You, I found out how many people, the moment they leave their front door, the, the shell is on mm. and the fear that they're walking through the world with and the anxiety and all of that, and it's not good enough. And, and we, you know, unfortunately now we live in a world with the way the healthcare system works is, you know, even people who know they're going through difficult times with dark and troublesome thoughts it's almost only when you then attempt to do something or that it's very, you know, that you actually see someone acting out a level of, I'll use the word, insanity, 
It's only then, it's only when actually society goes, oh, well, actually they knocked over that and they broke that and they set fire to that. Well, if someone's going and saying, look, I'm aware that I'm going through these things, the damage, the extra cost to them, socially, uh, psychologically, all of those things, the extra cost, if you just want to pragmatically say, the extra cost for society. Well, Mike McCarthy, the guy yeah. I mentioned earlier on, the Baton of Hope guy who co-founded that, his son Ross, had gone weeks previous to and said, I'm not okay. I'm not doing well. And the system was like, cool, we'll see you in six months. Yeah. And he's just like, okay, well, I guess, I guess I'm not getting help. You know, I'm not getting the support that I need. Don't want to put words into his mouth, but you know, it was, it was, um, you know, it's, it's powerful to think the system's just letting us down. I mean, have you ever been in that position where you just feel like, have you been in that kind of particularly I, dark been, place? I mean, what I generally, I would have very long periods of suicide ideation. Right. Uh, but I've never attempted anything. When, was, so, when so did this start? They would, do you know what? <laughs> Eight years old. Right. I used to get so worried about the world. In particular, when I was growing up, there was this great, big fear of rabies coming. And for some reason, as an eight-year-old, isn't it weird? The things that, just, quicksand, rabies. Yeah. You know, and, and like, I was, and I, I, I talked about this on stage once because it was a way. In, I, I basically, I had this. I, I did this, I was out in Australia and I became friendly with this woman who was a former head teacher. And one day when we were sitting in a hotel having a drink, she went, uh, you should do material about suicide because her daughter had taken her life. And she felt that if we lived in a world where you can just talk about these things. And, and that's what I really found was, and so I had, so I talked about the fact that I used to uh, try and kill myself by holding my breath. That's true, and, and then then you actually find out that, that that's that this is not going to work. The, we're, we've got this kind of survival system, so, <laughs> so I turned into a comedy routine. But then would also because I was chatting with someone who told me about that they, they said, "Oh, you won't know about this, Robinson." But I actually tried to take my life on three occasions, and the person's very happy now. But kept putting it, you know, when people go very selfish, and you go, you literally don't know how much someone's become disconnected because for this person. I said, so when you, it, it, one thing which I, I used to use, because you can tell an audience start to get a bit worried there, so I thought oh, I yeah, need to get to a punchline quite early. And it was the fact that on the Friday he went to take his own life and then went, hang on a minute, I don't want to kill myself today or I'll miss the weekend. I'll do it on Sunday. Yeah. So, and I said, you know, and your children? He said, I thought they might miss me for a couple of days. And that's what happened. You know, and that bit of being able to... Um, so I've been kind of lucky. I've, I've normally just had, I, I, you know, I used to have quite lengthy periods of, of, of a kind of what I would call a grey dog, not necessarily fully black, but I would, and it could take something very little minor. It could be, I did a 24 hour live uh, show, science show with, we had connections with all scientists in every one of the continents, right? It was, and, and myself and my friend Trent, this was about, or this was just after lockdown. Right. So we couldn't properly do the normal Christmas show. And, and my friend Trent, who is brilliant, uh, who I do all my stuff, stuff with on cosmic shambles or whatever and let's see you know let's do something really ridiculous and at the end of it unusually for Trent and me we both went we did really well and and we sat and we you know one in the afternoon the, and then I got home the next morning and it was like hey you're back well done and then I just got told why have you put that there and again the kind of with the ADHD thing what you find out is, is it can just take a tone of voice and your emotional circuitry just fries and that was it. I just shut down. And the thoughts were just all negative thoughts for three months. I think that's what people don't realise is it's not about it's not about cash in the bank. It's not about what you've got or don't have. It's it it can just be that thing that tips you, that thing yeah. that pushes you close to it. I mean, and the I was you know, I, I always think about the fact that when people say, It's not that you want your life to end, you want your life to end then. Yeah. At that moment in time. And then you know, when the people that have survived attempts then talk about, no, I did, I wanted it to end, I did. But then I realised I didn't, yeah. you know, and there was a realisation after that fact. Um, it is really, really tough material, like, tough material, tough, a tough to it's topic just really, to touch I on, mean, but... You know, an interesting uh, thing is suicide ideation is actually so common it's, that it's it? not even part of the test for a lot of neurodivergence because right, it's course. actually that you're more likely to be asked a question like, uh, do you leave the cupboards open? To which you may well reply, "Well, I don't think I do, but my partner says I do." Yeah, you know, which is just that—that that actually, ultimately, strangely enough, despite its banality, far more illustrative of the way the emotional circuitry in the working memory is. 
Um, and I think, you know, if we live in a, a world where people can openly talk about that, and, and you know, one of the things that I find interesting hanging around with neurodivergent people is there's not much banter. You have a really amazing time because you're all so excited about what you're talking about, <laughs> but you don't keep trying to put each other down. Right. And I think, you know, that again is, I ultimately, I'm sure people enjoy banter or whatever, but in the end, there's nearly always someone who's losing. And my, a bit like when you go, you know, night of comedy. Do you know Alistair Green? Have you ever no, seen his stuff on no. Instagram? He does this incredible little sketch, which is just him sat in the front row of a comedy club, just going, please don't pick on me, please don't pick on me, please don't pick on me. Well, oh, oh yeah. And it's just the horror. Yeah. And I think, well, far too many of our conversations can be that bit where someone leaves the pub that night feeling worse about themselves yeah. and thinking, well, I lost that conversation. And in fact, that's what I was going to say when I brought up Greenbelt. I'm so sorry. Like I said, I've had donuts and five coffees. But it is, you know, when I used to get asked to go and do debates with religious people, and I'd say, I don't want to have a debate. Why don't we have a conversation? Why do we have to find a winner? Why does someone have to win tonight's night at the pub? Why does someone have to win the debate with the Bishop of, Archbishop of Canterbury, whatever it is? Why don't we talk? And then we're going to find out something because we're not going to look towards the victory. We're going to look towards going, oh, that was interesting. You, talked, you said a second ago that some, you know, with, with somebody being the loser, uh, you know, where, where banter happens and, you know, and, and kind of steps over. I guess you came certainly to me, to my attention with, um, you know, the extras or the, uh, yeah. you know, the like, additional stuff on politics. And uh, what was the other one that you did? Um, uh, you did politics well, it, was, and you it was politics and fame. And fame, right? Yeah. Um, now, do you feel like you were the loser in that relationship? With Ricky Gervais, I think, um, I mean, I look back now and I really, I mean, the thing is, he's very easily bored. And I do think if you look a lot of his stuff, I think is, I look back now and I think it is bullying, really. It is I mean, I remember one night where we were, um, there was, it was a Christmas party and, and Rick used to make up this diary about me and, uh, and he decided to read it to everyone. And I forget how weird it is. So I'm very good at sometimes just acclimatising to things which I go, actually, this is really weird. So at the time, did you feel like it was weird? I, I realised that everyone else was really... Mackenzie Crook eventually went, Rick, can you stop doing it, please? It really, you know, he found it very... And people who knew me did not, you know, I, I would go through it, but people who knew me did not like the, the way that relationship worked. But we were, you know, we were we were what I would call gag friends. We'd ring each other up a lot and we'd talk to each other a lot. And I think the sad thing is I found it very difficult when he was... I saw some of his recent material... Uh, the trans jokes in particular. And I thought, and we'd argued about this. We, we, you know, I used to often say to him, look, man, this is, this stuff's really, you know, when you've got Lawrence Fox and Tucker Carlson and Nigel Farage, uh, uh, you just, uh, you know, really enjoying stuff. It's not good enough just to say, well, people have got the jokes wrongly. Because if that many people are getting the jokes wrongly, and it's not necessarily good enough to say that everything is ironic and you don't mean it if you also have lots of people using those punchlines as memes of philosophy for life. You know, you have to decide, are you the philosopher king or do your jokes mean nothing? And it was really interesting when, so eventually I thought I, I want to, you know, there's a lot of non-binary and trans people, you know, LGBT people who, who you know, love Monkey Cage and all of that kind of stuff. And I, I didn't want anyone to feel that because of my connection with him that, I, I also would have agreed mm. with with this kind of the anti-trans stance. So I wrote what I think was a very gentle blog post. I mean, I didn't, you know, I'm sure I could have sold it to someone. I didn't try and sell it to someone. I just put it on 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 my yeah. my blog on Cosmic Shambles, and uh, which we don't have any advertising. It doesn't make any, you know, it's nothing like that. And the reaction was really vicious and from Ricky. Well, from everyone. I never heard from Ricky again. We never spoke again. When was the last time you spoke? I must have been a week before I wrote that. Right, and that was what two years ago? Yeah, something like that. And I just think it's, and, and I think it's, I understand it, but I also go, hang on a minute. If you spend your life going, you're going to, hey, everyone in the world, you're going to hear things you don't like. Get over it. Well, and yet, I wrote, and I remember being really shocked because there was, like, it ended up on, you know, I trended on to you know that bit. Got a text. Sorry to see what's happening to you, and you go. See, that's not uh, happened to me. Not, not yet. Uh, <laughs> well, see, the, Brian Cox, the Brian Cox thing was almost like, you know. Yeah, but, but, but it's not about yeah. me. Do you know what I mean? It's about, you know, I'm just a conduit through which. But it was, yeah, so I had about, you know, three or four days of, of, of trending on that. And, and it was like, and I didn't mind. And I was, I was like, I just ignore it. And and of course, a lot of the a lot of the anti-trans people, I mean, they, you know, and, and, and that can be very difficult as well, because I think one of the powers is, especially, you know, if, if you're trying to be progressive to get people saying you hate women, 
And you go, well, don't hate women. What are you talking about? You know, in fact, the only reason I ever started really getting involved in in looking at what was going on in terms of, you know, uh, attitudes towards trans people was because I saw my cis female friends getting a huge amount of abuse and threats for the fact that they were saying they were trans allies. And again, in the most gentle way. And I thought, hang on a minute, this is all being focused as if, you know, there are people who organise such enormous pylons and, and no one realises that they think it only happens on one side. But, you know, I don't think there should be a you know, vicious abuse. I, I, I abhor that as any form of argument. But, you know, I was siding with, with friends of mine who, who have been feminist activists, all of them, in fact, for their whole lives, often to the, the, the you know, detriment of their career and, and some of whom have had hate on that. And, and so that's the only reason I got So I was getting all that stuff. And I was like, oh, well... That that's but I was I was a bit I, I, I suppose it's that thing you just have to so that was the end of our friendship but it was um I think I did the right thing and I, I stand by it but I was really shocked about six months later uh there was a Sylvia Lancaster who was the mother of Sophie Lancaster who was uh, a, a a young woman who was beaten to death uh and and she then started an anti-bullying campaign and when Sylvia died I thought oh I should I'm going to put that column up again, actually, that, that blog up again. Blog post As in to reshare it. Yeah, because I, I felt it was partly about bullying, how comedy can be bullying, and how I've done it. You know, oh, man, this is the whole thing. You know, you don't... When I was younger, I don't think I really... I saw a joke as just a joke. But what's funny is when I was I was looking at some of your stand-up yesterday and you said, um, where were you? It was... Um, it, it, it made me laugh. Um, I'm old enough to be the parent of some of the people in here if I came from a different social yeah, yeah, yeah. economic group. And which I'd never do now. Now, because that was me. Yeah. I was like, and, and know, it but- was. And I, I, and I know what the joke, and I know what to me it meant. It yeah. did, was not in any way meant to be a dismissal of other people. But I now look back and I, I realise that we're just jokes actually do help create the current and the understanding. And I know someone who heard that joke and, and is, uh, is dis- it was 20 years, over 20 years ago. Yeah, so I think you were and it was 37, dis- you, know, dis- so, yeah. dis- you know, disgusted uh, by it. And all I saw it as was a rhythm of words that led to a punchline. Yeah. And I, I love the fact, I mean, the shows that I do, as much as possible, I try and be really positive. A lot of them are about love. And, you know, people say, oh, no, you know, you get that thing, we go, yeah, but comedy's always been about hate. And you go, no, it hasn't. It doesn't have to be about hate. Who says hate's, about hate? hate's the simplest thing, is, you know, that everyone's always going to be the butt of a joke. And and I think it's a bit like, in, in the, I used to write a column for The Big Issue, which was about podcasts and radio. Yes. And I would only review things that I liked. So sometimes I go, oh, I'm going to listen to that. that I really like that comic. And then I go, oh, I didn't really like it. Oh, well, I'm going to write about something else. Yeah. I mean, do, do you know say, what? I think we should do that more. Yeah. I think do you don't just, write about if it's what not you hate, for you, tell it's okay. like, like the book you've given me, you know, looking at the book before the coffee gets cold, you, you you want to share something you love. Of course. That's, I mean, what is, it's a very human thing to want to share something. But, but again, going back to the media, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. You know, that's the, that's the thing. And we as humans are quite um, predictable with what we'll share and, you know, um, hatred, um, you know, anger, those things are powerful emotions that allow that we've got to find out about this. You know, it's just, but they're punches as well. But so, so love has a much longer tail than hate, hate very often. Boom. And then you need another kick. Oh, I need to hate someone else. Oh, I need to hate someone else. And, and like in in the gig I did last week, I ended up doing a, a, I wrote a poem about, telling people that you love them. There was, it was, uh, let me celebrate you now while you can still hear the cheer. Don't let me wait until you're gone to be fond. Don't let fear of embarrassment stifle my delight. And that, that's kind of how it starts. And Beautiful. and the next day, you know, the number of people who we get in contact with me, and I, it's my favourite thing when someone goes, oh, by the way, who's that poem by? Uh, yeah. go, the poem <laughs> is by me. <laughs> um, but, and I, I get such a kick. It's like that thing, you know, when you just do something to help someone, mm. Like you see someone has got a heavy suitcase yeah. and you're in a hurry, but you go, oh, you know what? If I miss the train, I miss the train. Yeah. And if I had that, I was at Euston when when the uh, escalators were broken and I just saw at the top of the spiral staircase, the, whoa, the suitcase. Whoa, whoa. And I, I remember going, all oh, right, I'm going to, uh, I, I, oh, do you need help? Oh, thanks so much. And so I missed, missed the train and got the next train. And then this person was getting off the train, just came up to him and went, can I just say, I absolutely love your podcast. Uh, I hope you don't mind me bothering you. Anyway, thanks. I'm just getting off here. So the reward was, one, I was glad that I helped her. 
it felt nice, you know, that bit of just looking out and it's going. Like, you know, and secondly, I was then rewarded by someone coming up and saying something really nice to me who wouldn't have been on the other train that I'd got on. And it didn't matter if that person had come up or not, but it, it was one of those reminders that sometimes when we measure everything out in, oh, my God, I'm going to be three minutes late. Oh, my God, this, 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 this and this. And you go, ah, to hell with it. Uh, you know what? That train's packed. And I can wait today, yeah. and I will wait today. Again, I, not in too karmic of a way, but you know, I do think positivity begets positivity. You know, and you are the sum of the people you spend your time with, and you you choosing to to do that. It's you know, again, friends. There's no such thing as a selfless good deed, right? But also, you know, your life will be you know just in that tiny, almost imperceptible way, improved by that person yeah. having come up to you and you know said, "I love your podcast," and it's it's a lovely thing. It's just affirming, isn't it? Do you feel like you're famous? No. How do you deal with being renowned or I being... I don't at all. I don't think about it. I literally, I make stuff and sometimes people come up to me and say something nice to me generally. And uh, when I used to be on Twitter, sometimes people would, you know, say really horrible things Are you just not on Twitter me. anymore? Yeah, I just gave it. I, I, I felt it was such a negative space and I also feel that it has the illusion of being a promotional tool when actually it's not. Most research shows that it, it's not very effective. It, you, you look like you're having interaction, but it's fake interaction. But yeah, so I don't think about it at all. I, I really try and... Uh, well, I don't even try. I just live a normal life and uh, I normally hang around with the audience. I find that you probably meet more interesting people in the bar than you meet in the green room of a lot of things. You know, I was, I was doing this Doc 2 convention and just hanging around with the people who were working in the kitchen and having a great time. And it's a really weird thing to me. It literally is that thing where I, I just said to them, I want a cup of tea. And I was, so I was making tea for people and I heard someone going, <laughs> because like you're incapable they, they thought that well they thought I would Brian Cox is in fact very, ah. very bad tea but it, it, it's that bit that there's meant to be I, I don't like the idea of again I, perhaps it goes back to my dad I don't like the idea of saying I'm on stage and you're not yeah. I very often with the live shows I do, I'm on stage when people are coming in. I chat to people, and then the lighting changes. And I did I go, read that somebody said about your fringe show, the last one. They didn't know um, the one where you were reading uh, books. Yeah, uh, weapons of empathy. Yeah, weapons of empathy. Um, they didn't know when it began. Yeah, they're like it's almost like we went in there and it was like, is is, is this started? Yeah, because you were just talking. Yeah, and, uh, I, and it just gives. It, and and then and I and and it means that you don't suddenly go now the show. Because uh, I want it to be, uh, you know, I, I I would I would hate people to think, you know, they then meet me and I go, actually, I hate books. It's an act. I found out there's pay dirt in pretending you love books. And I do really enjoy the relationships that I've had with, like I was doing an interview up at the Borders Book Festival and the person interviewing me went, in your book, Bibliomaniac, you talk about the fact that sometimes you get lifts with members of your audience. Isn't that scary? And I was like, what a world to live in. Because... So many times, like if I'm playing cool, well, when I when I give you a lift, like I will be, you know. Oh yeah, no, ig ignore, I am not ignore the, uh, to, you know, the mask. And, no, you, sh point. you shouldn't be. No, no, no. no. To. I, uh, I, I have almost no loose change even in my pocket. I'm not having you right. I'll find through. something. I'll the, find uh, something. You know, those uh, badges all gone. Yeah. <laughs> Robert Ince's <laughs> badges. They'll be worth something. But it is. But I, I love that. You know, there's a there's a, a a friend of mine called John, and I got to know John because uh, he tweeted me. I can't remember exactly what it was. He tweeted me when I was playing Winchester and he, and he couldn't come to the gig and I can't remember if it was financial or whatever. And I just said, look, if you want two free tickets, I said, I can just, you do it. You sit on the door, it's fine. And then we had a brief chat afterwards. And then I remembered his name because his name was very similar to a musician I know. So the next year I tweet him again and say, do you want free tickets tonight? And he says, I can't come. Unfortunately, my son's died. And his son, Jamie, had died in a motorbike accident. And a few months later, I'm playing outside Southampton and uh, John comes along and he'd been to the Cheltenham Science Festival with Jamie the year before because Alan Moore was there and I was doing events with Alan and they had a really great time. And he said, do you think I want to bring Jamie's ashes with a little T-shirt over the urn and get photos um, of, of Jamie with all the people that he really enjoyed seeing? Do you think that would be okay? I said, I'm sure it will. I'll have a chat in the groom and I'll tell people about why you're here and what's going on. And he did that. And we kind of got to know each other, you know. And the, like, I suddenly realised I was in Winchester, again, doing a gig on the anniversary of Jamie's death, that time that I sent the message. And I just sent a message to John. I said, there's a seat for you if you want to come tonight. 
If you don't, it doesn't matter. There'll just be an empty seat and that's not a problem. And I said, if you don't come, I'll do that sad poem that makes you cry about building dens. Uh, and if you do come, I won't. He said, do it either way. Do you know what's, what's the poem? It, it's, uh, it's about the um, when I was building a den with my son when he was nine and afterwards when he was asleep, I was thinking about would, will it, whether it would be the last den we built. So it, it's kind of, uh, see if I remember it, it's, it's, you don't need a storyteller now. Your bedtime is almost autonomous, but still one snuggly hug for safety from the Sandman. Is today the day? Is this our final den? We dragged the sticks and rolled the logs and made jokes about passing walkers with weird shaped dogs. And you found our furniture, a worn and mossy tire. And I warned you of all the dangers of that leaf hidden, rusty, rusty barbed wire. And then damp bottomed we sat and viewed our architectural feet. I phone filmed your pride for the archives of things we've done, the woodland adventures of father and son. Sometimes, walking hand in hand, I secretly mourn for the days that are not yet gone, those days that seem like a shepherd sketch for an A.A. Milne where every beach is a post-war postcard, the blue, too blue in my recall. Your freedom is necessity, but not yet, not yet, just... Just wait a bit. Let's let's pond dip for skaters with a net. Let's build a sofa train, a kick around, a Lego piece found by my bare foot. Let's read Peanuts at Dusk and Calvin and Hobbes. Let's dig and splash and play and mime laser deaths in outer space. Let's race. And then I'll let you go. And I'll kick the twigs alone. But not yet. One more day. So that was the, the poem. And that's just and for a second. That's incredible. It was, you know what? what? It was one of the first times that I, I, because I, I normally put a poem up every day now, and some of them are very half arse sometimes. But I, I saw them on Instagram. It was, um, yeah, but, and I love doing it, and I love, and I think that really helped me open up emotionally as well. Because did you write that about your relationship with your son? Yeah, and and now I'm writing a follow up about when he's we went to see Johnny Marr together. Because there was this lovely thing. I performed it in Liverpool. It was one of the first times I did it. And afterwards, this man came up to me. He was in his early 20s. He said, just so you know, the adventures don't stop. And then his mum leant in and went, yeah, but there were a few years it was hard to get you out of bed to have an adventure. Yeah. And I thought that was a beautiful thing. Right, yeah. But, and so I performed that. In fact, John saw me perform that uh, at the Northampton Old Labour Club. And he said afterwards, he said, you, uh, I'm very angry with you. He said, I don't like poems, and I like that poem. I don't cry in public, and I cried in public. Um, but then John came to that gig in Winchester, and I said, let's do his son, Jamie, when he was, I think, 13 or 14, uh, went up to John and went, Dad, I'm really drunk. I'm really drunk. And it was because he'd had three bottles of J2O. Oh, yeah, hammered. No, it wasn't alcoholic. <laughs> so one of the things that John and his family do is they go and uh, – pour J2O down the drain near where Jamie died. And so that night I did the poem and we both had a bottle of J2O. I told that story and then we just both cheered and drank the bottle of J2O. And it's like, and that came from just being friendly to an audience member who's now, and, and that thing is, and I love, an and incredibly I love incredibly human. Well, it's just, thing. and that's, the what, that's what it is, right? Of getting to know John and getting to know his family and his daughter, and uh, and the reward of you know, and, and I also know one of the things that I love again why stories are so important is John really likes me talking about it. The right reason I I, I just told no, that fact, story. You know, now he exists in this too. Yeah, that's what that's I, what it, I like right? doing is is because I know that for him. You know, they keep the adventures of Jamie going. Every year they stick some of his ashes in a firework and send it up, you know. And, uh, in fact, you know, John says, God, I, I, there's a lot more than you imagine of these ashes. You know? and it's like, <laughs> but it, it's, And I also know, of course, I equally know, you know, there's a lot of fun to be having it, but underneath it all, there's a terrible, terrible loss. And he's able to have, you know, both... And, and, and so those... It helps us understand it, right? Yeah. Helps us put it into perspective. I mean, as you were... Um, reciting that and again thank you so much for that because it does it brings a tear to your eye you know I mean, I'm a dad of four and there's that you know there was a last time that I picked some of them up you know it's that that you know there was a last time that you went out and played with your friends yeah yeah when you were a kid and then and, and it's 
Christ, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I get over sentimental about things like that constantly. You probably don't get uh, overly yeah. sentimental. You probably get correctly sentimental. I, I think there's no. This is we. We should not put down that. You know, we we just. It's again. We're talking about hate and love. I find it hilarious that people are embarrassed. To, like I, like Womad. There, uh, when I played the literary stage there last year, the woman who's running the stage came up to me and she went, "Oh my god, this is so embarrassing." But I'm I'm a big fan of your work, and I said, "Well, hopefully." It's not embarrassing. Hopefully your friends haven't said you should be really embarrassed. Yeah. And I said, if you are, a, you know, you should be embarrassed if you came up to me and, oh, my God, uh, everyone here hates you and we're really annoyed <laughs> that we've booked you. That would be embarrassing for me. Yeah. It's embarrassing for everyone. <laughs> the fact that you enjoy what I make is not, you know, I, what a reward that you're able to. And, and I think that's we still have this tremendous fear of, of saying, because it's one of the things that, going back to the boarding school thing, like my friend Ed, who I mentioned, he, the first conversation, he told me to piss off, right? He was quite red-faced. We were on a school bus. We'd come back from some kind of sporting thing. And I probably just said to him, oh, yeah, this was really tiring, wasn't it, doing all that? And he'd piss off. And the reason he did that, I know now, is because within a term, he had realised that any showing of yourself meant that probably someone was trying to get at you. And so I, in my naivety, was often very friendly to people who thought everyone was a threat. Mm -hmm. Now imagine that, you know, that schooling, that means you hide... I think Adrian Edmondson has that. Adrian Edmondson, I think you sometimes see it in autobiography, which is, obviously, I think the boarding school he went to, he learned never to say that he loved anything because if you say you love something, it gives someone a power over you, they think, because they can smash it and say it's rubbish. In the same way, if you say, if you're chatting to girls, oh, you're chatting to girls. Spooner, well, or whatever it was. <laughs> all of that, to me, is totally the opposite because you don't, if someone then says that's rubbish or whatever, you can just go, yeah, whatever. It's subjective. Yeah. And let us, if the more of us who talk about what we love, the more of us who say, you know, I, I, I've, I, I, I love sending messages to friends of mine every now and again to say, just say so you no, know, I really love the fact that we're friends and I think you're brilliant and your work is absolutely amazing. And I have no shame in doing that anymore. And, and I think, why should, why should I feel, you know, I send fan letters to people that I work with who I actually know quite well because I just go, you know, dear John Hegley, just to remind you, I just really, you have been such an artistic influence on me and and that you know we're meant to our oh, sentimental more it's not it's it's the 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 power of saying i love this you're allowed to with football but that's all and even then of course you'll always have that antagonism. you have to be yeah you have to be aggressively yeah aggressively into it can't just be like you know oh, i'm really yeah. into this yeah it is it's hilarious when I, I don't know that i've ever felt particularly like I couldn't be open and about loving something. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm funny with my friends now. I've, I've told them in the last few years, you know, I'm you know, male, male friendships are a wonderful thing. You, you mentioned Mackenzie Crook earlier. Have you watched um, the detectorists? Oh, I love the detectorists. Now, of course. Yeah. What beautiful. an incredible way to look at male relationships and our yeah. hobbies and our foibles and our oddness. Um, and, you know, with my friends, you know, I'm, I'm like, I you know, tell them, exactly yeah. as you just said you know not, mate love you you know i really appreciate what we got here um and it's funny because one of my friends it, he's been so supportive of this since i've been talking about doing interviewing for, for years and years and it, you know, a handful of things stopped me my you know worry concerns about giving too much about my family or yeah. things like that perhaps um you know but then there's an edit right which is wonderful and then as soon as you realize that you can you know go oh i probably shouldn't have said that about that person that's you know it, you know, in in a bad spot still. Um, you know, you realise, oh, well, maybe I should just run at this, and you know, be passionate about it, and being, yeah. you know, be curious and be enthusiastic and all these things. So, one of my friends has been super positive. Um, you know, we end every phone call going, "Love you, mate." Yeah. You know, and it's silly, but it's also not. You know, I do mean it. You know, I've known that guy since I was eleven. You know, we've been through a lot together. I I care a great great deal about him, and the same for lots of my other you know male friendships. I think we're taught not to, um, you know, be overly. And I mean, because at rugby, right, everything's gay. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Everything's gay. You know, oh God, you know, uh, you know, if, if you, you know, share, show some care towards a teammate, it's like, gay. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think, I like to think that we're moving slightly away from that as a notion. But, um, yeah, apologies there's for a, saying. There's a great line in Leonora, a book about the artist Leonora Carrington, which I love, which is, uh, to those who live in emotional poverty, other people's happiness is a threat. 
And I think that bit of going, yeah, okay, if you want to put me down, if you yeah. want to then do that. But now, and before it would have, you know, again, I think I've, I've, the power that I now have by not having to deal with as much anxiety as a, it is right, why I'm going to use it while I got this, yeah. just in case it does eventually crash. I don't know. Do, hopefully you, do not. you think that the experience with Ricky and what you said was effectively like tantamount to a former bullying? Do you think that, that has, improve like has changed you because you're already in your late 30s mid to late 30s at yeah. the time right do you think that that's changed the way you look at things um i don't do you know what i don't think so i think I, I think it helped me understand that what i was interested in was not playing big theaters right. was not that way showbiz worked yeah. was not that way that, you know because you also see the way that people fall into line and i don't like that i don't like that sense of uh so i kind of watch things like that and and it certainly it made me realise how much I didn't like the stand up I was doing because I did some what I would consider to be pretty bog standard stuff, which didn't re which wasn't really representative of me. It didn't. It, it's it's a thing that I've, I've often talked about. This George Carlin, the great American comic, talked about. I love George Carlin. He's so good, isn't yeah. he? Talked about the difference between a comic and a comedian, and I can't remember which way around it is, but I think he says, you know, a comic is someone who you can watch on stage for an hour. And you laugh all the way through, but you've learned nothing about them whatsoever. And a comedian is someone... So Billy Connolly yeah. is definitely a comedian. Right. George Carlin was definitely a comedian. You know, Josie Long is definitely a comedian. You know, they, they are people who... the very. It's, it's like that whole thing of... I think there is a difference in comedy between those who... It's, it's a profession mm -hmm. and they've worked out a game plan. And there are those who do it because they must. And I think all my friends are people who do it because they must. Even if you didn't earn money from it, you would still be creating something because it's not a job. It's something that you have to do. That's, that is genuinely how I felt with this, yeah. is I have to do it because, yeah. you know, I think... I, I learned something about myself by talking to people like you and it's wonderful. And it, so there is a selfishness to it. Um, and it is, I guess, it started with speaking to successful people about who they are, why they are, who they are, drive, ambition, resilience, all of these things, and get into, the, do you know the number one thing that I've got to is obsession? Every single person I speak to, but was at some stage an apprentice to their their craft, their chosen yeah. career, and was obsessed. And I can tell it in the way that you speak about comedians, and the way you spoke about Rick Nail earlier on, and you said you've watched hundreds of, you know, triple digit yeah. figures. Again, you're not, you know, you're not um, taking that notion away from me of, it's obsession. Oh yeah, gets, I've never and I've you... never lost that. I still I love sitting with people when we just talk about the history of comedy. Like there's a wonderful guy who runs gigs up in the northeast of England called Peter Dixon, and he's been going to gigs since the 1960s, and he's got such a rich knowledge, and he still just loves gigs, and he loves comedians, and he loves all that, and and it is the joy of talking to him. And the joy of people, you know, that excitement about sometimes, you know, someone that no one else has heard of, some strange little novelty act, or the joy of someone's making a, a documentary at the moment about the Iceman. You know the Iceman? Yes. Um... He's the guy who used to stand on a block of ice and try and melt it over the 20 minute set he had and then note down the block of ice and that was the end of that experiment, <laughs> right? It was, it's in those days right, of alternative okay. cabaret. And, you know, and I, when I was doing the interview about that, because I, I actually never saw him, but there was a lot of other eccentric acts that I saw before I began doing stand-up when I was 15, 16 years old. And I just love, you know, and the people making that documentary, like a lot of the documentaries that I make with Trent, that I put on Cosmic Shambles, they're made because we can and we know that no one else will make them otherwise. You know, making the documentary about my dad's books and, and the connection with those books, that was a great way of me two days after my dad died going with my sisters, let's make something, let's make something concrete out of this. And then, you know, when I go down, oh, I'm going to a library today and they're going to take me down the cellar where all the books are stored. Let's make a documentary about that cellar. Let's make a documentary about the Large Hadron Collider. Let's make a documentary about this doctor. Who how do you, like, when you, when you get an idea like that, how do you then bring it to life? Well, fortunately, I say, Trent, let's make this. And Trent has to go and get all the equipment out and everything. So I am the, the annoying person who's always bubbling. And then who's ideas. selling that into broadcasters or, you know, who's... We don't do it. We literally just put it on the website and, and we try and we don't make a, you know any money from it, really. You, know, you, you, you can support us and that's great. So please do go to Patreon. Uh, but yeah, Cosmic Show, I, I'm really proud of what we made because I think we, we 
have so, I mean, we've got about 12 documentaries which we haven't finished making because we've got all the raw material. Because Trent always goes, you do know I have to edit them. And oh, yeah. Them and everything. And go, yeah, well, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. I've got another idea. I've got another idea. Hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> no, uh, you know, somebody's going to have to edit this, right? <laughs> yeah, so. I just, but I love, you know, and, and Trent is so great to work with and I'm so pleased that we, we got to know each other. And and he is just, you know, and, and so I'll suddenly be doing, like when we started doing, the, when I was doing this Doc 2 convention up on the Wirral for, for my friend Erica, Sebastian McCoy was up there and stuff. And we just started making a documentary. And what I love is, I just said, well, let's just start doing something and just see, you know, we don't know what it'll turn into. It might just be a little piece for Erica about her Doc 2 convention. But then we started talking to people and very quickly I realised it was going to be a documentary all about the importance of diversity, how Doctor Who helps so many people, in particular LGBT community, giving them role models and giving, you know, for generations now, and so now we're going to make a half-hour documentary, an hour-long documentary about how Doctor... You know that thing I was saying about Tom Baker walking down the street and the kid from the care home? You know, all of that side of Doctor Who, that side of how those on the outside had a place to go when Doctor Who was on and still do. And, and now I'm even more excited by it because I'm like going, ah, oh, what we thought was just going to be a quick documentary we made in the day is actually now going to be one of my grand projects. <laughs> hurry up, Trent, hurry up, you know. <laughs> Brilliant. So you got 12 on the go. Yeah, and we've got, we, I can't remember the next one that's going to go out. We've got, I've done, I've done a bunch with, Stuart Lee and I did a bunch of uh, conversations about Italian westerns, not the really famous Of course you did. Kind of, yeah, why yeah. Did, just, why wouldn't you, know, you? And that was a lot of fun, and so that's how do, going out. I mean, how do you even have a knowledge of Italian westerns? I'm interested in everything. That's why I have no depth of it on anything. But it's like really interesting, because what we realised as we talked is a lot of the low-budget Italian westerns, which are really amazing, one of the things that's great about them is, because there's such a low budget, the only thing that exists is the set and nothing right. else so it is like the horseman is coming from a world that does not exist oh, yeah. comes into existence like a ghost in the town and then vanishes into it so it becomes almost like kind of you know science fiction horror kind of thing so we're off the chapman now you yeah. went to the science festival um what are you gonna be talking about uh, today we're doing a children's special, which is great. So it's all schools that are coming, and we've got 12 questions that have been given by uh, various members of the schools. And we've got Jess French, who's great. She's really... Uh, uh, Adam Kay, the doctor who, who who wrote uh, this... What's it? This May Hurt. I've forgotten the name of the book now. Yeah. And and Steve Batchel, who's, wow. who's wonderful. So we're just going to... So that'll be a lot of fun to do. Amazing. Well... Robin, I, yeah, we, we probably should go. So, yeah, thank I'm so you. sorry. I'd like to. to Christ, uh, I mean, an absolute joy to talk to you. And I, I, I would like to apologize to everyone for how many non sectors uh, there were. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful because it gives me so many things to then come back to and, and you know, try and pick up pieces. But also, it's, it's just great fun chatting to somebody who's got so, they're so enthusiastic about everything. You know, yeah, and, I'm so, you know, to, to, to finally get the release to just, you know, have an enthusiasm which underneath did not have this, you know, the, 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 the grey dog yapping is, is a joy. Oh, there you go. That's a great way to end it. Robin, much Thank appreciate you. it, mate. Cheers. And we're back. I hope you enjoyed it. I told you he's got one of those brains. He's an incredible brain. Um, keeping him on task, keeping him on track. It, it, <laughs> two people that go off on tangents left and right. Um, hopefully, it didn't hurt your head too much. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing that. As I said, lots to think about with the podcast and you know the show in general and, and all that stuff. I'm going to stop being cryptic because it's boring. Nobody likes that. Follow us at The Starting Line Show or at Starting Line Show on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. Um, I post content. You, you might like it. Who knows? Um, Facebook, Starting Line Podcast, and on LinkedIn as well. And if you want to get in touch, it's hello at startinglinepod.com. I think that's everything. All of the plugs, all of the chat. I'll leave you alone now. Have a great time. Goodbye. Forever.